gather in local media. If you could all please rise for the pledge of allegiance. This meeting is being recorded. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I should also state because we're, uh, I guess, a Zoom meeting tonight that we're recording too, right, Mr. Gilberto? That's correct, yes. Okay. All right, welcome everybody. We have our first order of business, which is public comment. Is anyone here to provide public comment? Mr. Evans, yes. wow. how are you? Good, good. Please come. Where would you like me? Where would you like, where would you like me? The, with a microphone. Is you can ha sit or at the podium? Is there a microphone uh, there? There's oh. a podium right there. A microphone right next to oh, like right here? Oh, yeah. You can sit right there, Mr. Yeah. Just identify yourself Super. for the record. And so uh, it's Eric Evans. I'm over at 3 Sandra Lane in uh, North Reading. Um, <clears throat> they're watching a lot of uh, NORCAM. I think my family thinks I have a NORCAM problem watching all the board meetings. But trying to stay up to date on everything. <laughs> Yeah, you're, the, you're the one attendee. Yes. <laughs> so e even though it's, it's great to have that resource, but um, i got to stay up with Norcam a little bit. But trying to stay up with everything going on in town. And I've been going to a few of the board meetings more recently. Um, and I'm starting to have some concerns about um, how policies are made in town with the different, um, all the different authorities that we have to uh, <clears throat> look to for our um, health advice, especially through the pandemic the last couple of years. Uh, a lot of inconsistencies, you know, we have uh, decisions made at the local level through the Board of Health. We have uh, the Board of Health making health decisions. We have the town manager making health decisions. Um, we have at the state level, we have the Mass Department of Public Health, as well as DESE making decisions for our schools. And then at the federal level, we have the CDC and other federal agencies dictating policies that we uh, sometimes follow and sometimes don't. So all this becomes incredibly confusing. <coughs> you know, to a, to a citizen as to, you know, which mandates are we listening to, uh, which ones are working, which ones aren't. So as the elected officials here in North Reading, I think it's really incumbent on, on the board to put a committee together, which I would certainly volunteer to be on, to look at the policies, you know, what's worked over the last couple of years, what's not worked over the last couple of years. And so when the next pandemic or next, you know, situation we're into, you know, we can kind of figure out some things that, you know, that were effective and things that weren't. So um, that's basically what I wanted to say. I just, I just feel like the town, you know, I'm kind of worried about the liability we've gotten ourselves into with some of the things we've done. And um, that's my comment. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Well, we're going to move on to business. Um, we have the pleasure of introducing our new town clerk. Take okay. it away, Mr. Gilbert. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, Ms. Susan Duplin is here this evening. Sit up. I don't know if you want to come to the table, Susan. Come on. Say hello to us. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Susan will be joining us uh, in the position of town clerk beginning next Wednesday, March 9th. And she comes to us from the town of Swampscott, where she has served in the capacity as town clerk since 2007. So she has quite a bit of experience uh, in the capacity as uh, town clerk, and I have spoken with some folks who work with and alongside the town of Swampscott, and I know she is well uh, respected. Um, I think we are benefiting principally from our geographic location. We are uh, certainly uh, closer to home um, for Susan who lives in southern New Hampshire. I um, should also note that Susan also has experience working uh, as assistant town clerk at the town of Winthrop where she was from 2001 to 2007, was also the town council clerk for a couple of years as well. Right. Um, we're pleased that Susan uh, is uh, able to, uh, to join us and, uh, and come on board. Um, we uh, are really proud of the staff that we have in the office, and Carol and Stephanie, who are both here this evening, um, and um, you know that the insight that she'll be able to provide uh, in the office uh, for them, uh, what is already a very well-run and very well organization that we all know. Um, Here. We thought we'd bring her to introduce you all to her and to put a face with a name um, as she has um,
walked in and um, got it working right away. And um, I've done probably over, I lost count actually, over 100 elections in over 30 town meetings. We have a representative town meeting in Swamp Spot, so it's a little bit more involved. But, um, and, you know, um, I work very hard. You know, I, I promise I would give you my best professionally, ethically, you know, respectfully, and honestly. And, um, you know, and I was mentioning to um, Mike, you know, that, um, you know, I need more help too in the office too, so I'm excited to have staff too. Mm -hmm. I've already met them. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. So, and also, there's the same amount of re residents here as the Swamp Scott, and we have the same amount of registered voters, and we have the same town website, so I don't need any training on the website. Um, we also maintain the same boards and committees website page as well. And I also deal with all the same um, federal and state agencies that you have too. So it would be a smooth transition coming on board, and I'm, I'm very excited to get started. Is the election yet? Yep, right after the election. <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> Elections is one of my forte, so. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody, any comments and questions? Well, just welcome, welcome aboard. Yeah. And I look forward to uh, seeing you a lot around town, all around town, and again, welcome. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you express Thank an interest you. and willingness to come. So. Thank, Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you. You have a great area and great hands. Mm -hmm. Yes, you said. I see that. And we look forward to some suggestions and recommendations you can make on things. You mm -hmm. know, like Mr. Evans was talking about policy. And maybe there's a, maybe we can highlight those things in a different way, or even use a different website type. But we look forward to those types of things, so kind of future future things that we can kind of broaden the outreach to non-branding residents. Mm -hmm. I think your your role in the art department is, is crucial for that. It's pivotal for that. All the machinations of, of how town government works, and how not ready town government works. So we yes. welcome you and wish you the best. I'm always, I always like to get more information out there than less. You know, so amen. Yes, more information for the residents, whatever's going on, you know, in the department. And I've also implemented two different voting machines, and I know that's going to be in the future here as well. So, yeah. So, with that, and so thank you very much. And, and honestly, you. honestly, North Brunswick citizens are much friendlier than Swamp Scott. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. We're far less entitled. You can tell right? that already. <laughs> <laughs> no. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, I would like to recognize uh, Stephanie Conley, who is serving as our temporary town clerk for the past few weeks, and Carol Ducro. Uh, both have you know, said that they would do whatever it would it takes to keep the office moving, and I think things have gone pretty smoothly the past couple of weeks. Uh, Ms. Stats has made herself available to help us uh, intermittently, so that's been helpful too. Uh, but I just want to thank you both for uh, everything that you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for caring. Caring. Thank you. Thanks for caring. Caring. Thank you. Great. Great. Welcome thank you. to work. All right. Our next order of business is um, public hearing on the June and October town meeting dates for 2022. Excuse me, Madam Chair, just oh, a, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Just a matter of personal privilege, and I, I think it's sure. just uh, an oversight on our part that, you know, I, I think we should uh, acknowledge uh, what's occurring in Ukraine, and uh, for whatever we do, but we offer our support, our prayers, and uh, acknowledge uh, how the world is coming together support uh, the Ukrainian people and what's uh, what they're being subjected to by Russia. And I just think it's it's astounding how quickly everybody is coalescing around this, this country and they're offering, it's not just other countries, but also private enterprise and individuals. And, uh, I just think, you know, maybe we should do something either a moment of silence or prayer or something and uh, we can acknowledge what, what's occurring. Maybe other people have other comments. Before we get into everything else, I think it would be appropriate. I think it's fine to, if we want to take a moment of silence and solidarity with the individuals who are being.
invaded right now. Their homes are being, you know, their uh, lives are being invaded literally. And um, if we want to pray or send out, you know, bright light uh, for peace, peace in the world, peace that we don't, none of us have to join in that. You know, we, we keep ourselves, you know, peace of, peace of uh, let bring peace to that quickly, swiftly, quickly bring peace to that region and hope that it ends quickly and uh, there's no more aggression showing there. So, you know, we want peace, I guess, and so we're in solidarity with everyone for peace and no war, right? Is that a consensus of our board? Yeah, war is old hat. It's like we're done with that. And it's remarkable that we're actually living through this in our time. Mm -hmm. So, so why? So why don't we just take a moment of peace? Whatever you want to do, pray peace. We we'll just take a moment of silence for that purpose. Charter, the town meeting may be held on any day that's not a legal or religious holiday. Um, we've gone through the calendar and identified um, recommended dates for the June and October town meetings. For June, we are recommending Monday, June 6th um, as the uh, day for, to, have to hold an evening town meeting, um, which we intend to hold at the middle high school indoors. Uh, it is the last day of the uh, religious, uh, the Jewish religious holiday, Shavuot. Um, although the holiday does end at sundown, as I understand it, and it, it is not uh, a particularly significant um, holiday. Uh, we have held town meeting on the last day um, in three prior years, I think either 2017 or 18 we did it, and so we're, we're comfortable with recommending that um, as a schedule moving forward. Town meeting normally beginning at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, on the Monday. For the arc June 6th. June 6th. Monday, Monday June, June 6th. 6th. Yes. 7 p.m. Correct. Yes. For the October town meeting, um, it's a little bit more complex, not because of the calendar, but depending upon the desire of the town. Um, what we've identified here is um, the, uh, the latest possible Monday evening, October 24th, figuring that most will not want to attend a meeting on Halloween on October 31st. Um, for the town meeting to be held. And that is by design to maximize the amount of time um, between the end of the summer and uh, the town meeting as we are trying to educate folks with regard to the wastewater project. This would allow us uh, to hold the discussion on the wastewater project um, at, a, uh, at one of our an two annual town meetings and not be subject to a quorum requirement. Um, so I talked to the finance director. It is late. It will put some pressure on us from a financial standpoint, but I think it is something we feel we can work within. Um, and it actually only ends up being about 10 days later than the latest town meeting we've had in recent years because of the variance of the schedule. So our recommendation will be to go forward with the Monday, October 24th meeting. If we are not ready with wastewater, we have the option available for proceeding with a special town meeting if need be. But I think the thinking that, that I know I'm subscribing to is this is the best shot at us not having to worry about a special town meeting or a quorum requirement associated with it. So it will be Monday, October 24th at the Middle High School. Meeting. 
All right, so June 6th and October 24th, and right. we, are, we are in a public hearing. Mr. O'Leary, comment? Yeah. I, I, first of all, I, I believe that the uh, wastewater issue should be standalone special town meeting. One thing to talk about that night, whatever night that's going to be. And uh, <clears throat> I, I really truly believe that. You know, that I agree. It, it shouldn't necessarily be uh, tied in with everything else. Again, if you put it up front, you know, the meeting, then other things get postponed, the meeting goes out, it could be a long, long meeting. So it's, you know, to me, it's, uh, the issue itself is freestanding and should be uh, <laughs> discussed by itself. should have a separate night. And if we can't get 150 people uh, to show up to express their support or raise their questions, I'd be surprised. You know, so. Uh, yes, but, yeah, I think we should just, if it's from a regular operational standpoint, I think the October time we should be what it normally is. And again, depending upon how the information flows to the subcommittee and everything else comes back, uh, you know, just schedule a special town meeting for the issue uh, whenever it's feasible. And again, our goal is October. That's what we've been stating all along. Uh, again, I just think it should be a separate night all by itself. Mr. Studer. I, I agree completely. I feel uh, we're just asking for a continuation of that meeting on the 24th, just like my first meeting of June 2018 when I just became a resident where it got continued because of one item that should have probably been standalone from my perspective, but yeah, I yeah, I think everything else would just, I think we're gonna get more than the 150, Mr. O'Leary, I do. Um, I hope you're right about that. You know? I mean, it just, uh, it's something where it's gonna be intricate. There's gonna be questions that are expected, questions that aren't expected. Those in favor and against who are gonna come with already, you know, they're a pad of questions of, you know, nine out of 10 mean nothing, but we still have to answer them. And that's why I think it should, yeah, I agree with Mr. O'Leary, because this, sometimes like after we're on a call for three hours, I need to call Mike for another hour for mm -hmm. clarification, sure. so. Okay. Um, Mr. Gilberto, do you think you can, uh, is that something that we want to um, at, uh, talk about now? And uh, I mean, it's, have moving parts leading up to that. So is that something you want to just at least set a tentative date for now? I mean, or are we going to just wait until these things are? For, for a special time meeting? Yes, yeah. I probably want We're to talking about it now, so it's, this is the time to let general public know what the plan is and hear from the general public that no wants to talk about it. So, Madam Chair, through you to address that feedback, you know, suspecting that that could be the direction the board wants to go in. Um, Monday, October 3rd, the kind of traditional night we would have the town meeting yeah, is an available evening for us to have town meeting. So, I mean, let's get a consensus. Mr. O'Leary wants us, Mr. Walmer, are you in agreement with that? I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I trust, the, yeah. the, the, I think focus is important. I do yeah. think 150 people or more will show up. Um, you know, if it gets pushed in November or December, I think we're pushing it at that point, so I don't think it should take too long after the regular town meeting to have it. It would be ideal to have it in October. Um, Mr. Studo wants that as well. Mrs. Gonzalez, what's yeah. your thought on that? So what, what was, were you saying that we would have our regular town meeting on the 3rd and then that special town meeting on the 24th? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I was pr proposing that we that would we have would. the fall annual town meeting on October 24th, oh. thinking that it would be a single town meeting. If the board, right, I, I'm aware of the desire to potentially have the special town meeting, and that's totally fine. Separately, but if we did, my suggestion would be to back up the October town meeting into early October, and then leave that twenty-four, or, or later yeah. even, depending upon when we need it for special town meeting. So, so back to the third of October. Correct. Yeah. Third would be the special town meeting. No, be the regular, 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 regular town meeting, and any time after that, you could do that within the confines of a calendar. The special town meeting. Okay. Okay. So and basically that. You know, um, should we choose a tentative date on that, or should we? Should I don't think we have to republish for a special town meeting. You don't need to select a special town meeting at this meeting at this hearing, okay. and I wouldn't advise you to because okay. I can't give you the calendar with a yes. reliable information. Right. Right. No, it's too early. Okay. Well, we 
we can be optimistic. I know, I'd be optimistic. <laughs> okay, and, and you know, that that is, it is, I, I agree, I agree wholeheartedly with my colleagues on that. That is a standalone uh, opportunity. It, it has a massive impact on the town financially as well as in the town, for the town's future. So that is something that we'd like to elicit as much participation. We want that for our regular town meetings too. So when we talk about issues of who's setting policy, in North Reading it comes down to people voting at the town meeting. That's what it's all about. We just shepherd it there, and if no one shows up at the town meeting, it's left to the, the people that are here that are showing up for everything, and the volunteers that are showing up for everything to make the decisions on, on those types of things. The committees, policies, procedures, et cetera. So, we need people to show up, not just at the special one, but all the regular ones too. There's only two annual meetings, so. And we just find ourselves together again, the same people that we see all the time. So show up at the town meetings and take a, make a vote, because that's what the town of North Reading's all about. The town rules, the town vote rules at the town meetings. I always say that here, but mainly we never have an audience. <laughs> um, Lucky you. So we'll, so we'll take it to comment on those two dates at this point since it's a public hearing. Does anyone want to make any public comment on those couple of dates that we picked for the, the town meeting schedule, the regular town meeting schedule? Anyone? Mr. G Mr. Evans. Just, yeah, one comment. With the um, having two meetings close together dilute the overall turnout, because you have two back close together, but regular and special versus just you know, the regular spacing? Hopefully not. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't assume that. Everybody, everybody shows up for one, and then two weeks later, they're back for another one. It might, it might have a dilutional effect there. So. That's such a, you know, the, the things that we tackle during the regular annual meetings are extremely important, obviously, for the town. But this, the wastewater, the sewer line, is really is going to, more, more likely than not, have a lot of a lot more back and forth than some of the, the water particles on the radio of the town. I don't know if anyone Mr. I, anyone wants to add to that. I agree. I mean we had that special town meeting in the middle of summer on a hot day to do the turkey farm, right? And uh, right. a ton of people showed up for that. And that wasn't that far away from the regular meeting in, in June or whatever we did it. So and it was an important issue. So I think we will get a lot of participation, even if it's close. Yeah. Mr. I just have a question. Uh, are we allowed to, once we have more data, um, could we theoretically push town meeting later into October if we thought we were going to have like a late town meeting, I don't know, like a, a Monday, like the last Monday in September or that first Monday in October for the special one meeting? Can you have this one first? Like, can you push the regular town meeting by three weeks, or does it have to be that Monday? No, I, we 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 had the the we had the change so that we could have a little bit more leeway in terms of the planning of it. But I think what Mr. Gilberto is saying is put the put the regular town meeting first before the okay. special town meeting. Are you saying it should be the reverse? Well, I'm just saying that if we do at some point think that it's going to be. You know, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate to what Mr. Evans said, that if we do think that's the case, I mean, with all due respect to our regular uh, talking about how we're not going to use our free cash for another year, I do think that the special town meeting is more important, like, for that, for that project in particular. I don't, I don't know if there's any, I do think people will show up to both, but I, I, I could see where there could be fatigue. Special, you know, I mean, it can be, it can be a lot. It's I can appreciate that, but from from my perspective, we shouldn't be rescheduling meetings over fatigue. No, it's not a reschedule. We volunteers haven't. that are there are fatigued from all the meetings, and I think we had how many special meetings? The turkey farm we had, we had, I don't know how many, three, two or three special meetings that year, in addition to right, didn't we? We had at least we, two. We had one meeting, but it got moved around multiple times. Oh, our, I'm, I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, we better off doing it separate months. I like don't. 30 I don't, days apart. I don't, make a difference? I don't think it makes a difference. But what we're setting here now, if we have to reset it, we have to republish and post it in public hearing to change that. So what we're voting on here is 
the annual town meetings. The special meeting set aside. Set Tonight's agenda item is setting those because of the requirement to publish the, okay. get the warrant articles done and publish the warrant articles in enough advance. Oh, time. no, I, I understand that, yeah. but then, then I'm just confused. It's the 24th? The, the, it should now say October 3rd. Okay. okay. October 3rd. October 3rd. Okay. June 6th and October 3rd. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Because the special wouldn't be set now. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay, Mr. 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 Walmart. Oh, I'm just going to say you could always let's say something magically happens with the sewer and you want it to be prime focus. You can make that the agenda for October 3rd. Mr. If, I mean, I'm, I mean that's the flexibility we have available. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't suggest it, but that could happen. That would be wonderful, actually, Mr. Oli. That would be wonderful if that happened. <laughs> well, in the, in the 50 years that I've been attending uh, town meeting. Uh, with this such a major issue, it, it should be separate by itself. But it doesn't preclude the board from having a special within the regular. But what we're doing tonight is setting the regular town meeting. That's pretty yeah. much driven by the charter. We only have two times a year and specific times. Uh, so that's what we're doing. And so it'll only be the first week of October. Uh, and again, depending upon how things flow here, as far as information uh, gathering and all the rest, you know, our goal is for October town meeting. Uh, what we're still striving for, but it, I don't think there's going to be fatigue. I think there's going to be a high amount of interest because we're going to be doing an awful lot of uh, community outreach, a lot of public education, a lot of answering your questions uh, prior to, and I just think there's going to be a significant amount of public uh, public input and a, a lot of uh, public interest uh, to get this thing decided. You know, uh, once we have all the information. So I, I, I don't I don't think it's a uh, Ms. Davis. I don't think that's going to have any impact as far as a lack of interest or or impact people's uh, willingness to come out twice, you know, to address uh, the town of town affairs. So, and I'll add to that too that what we've been doing is a, a kind of a mini mini public hearing, including virtually. We we've had a lot of participation virtually on those mini public hearing before the public hearing. So the the questions that people have on them, uh, they're they're being asked, and I think we we have even just attendance at those. Um, which I think has been helpful virtually. Um, that maybe someone can't get to every every one of our meetings on uh, every <coughs> whenever we're meeting, but there those are posted and published as a you know a public hearing to ask questions on those, and that's been I'd like to keep that going mm -hmm. forward. I think that's been pretty successful at um, getting some of these more, more involved warrant articles, questions and answers, questions and answers. Gotcha. So I would really hope that we're going to do that anyway for the uh, for the sewer anyway. Get the word out as much as we can. So do we have any other comment on that? Any other public comment? And is there anyone joining us online that has any comment or question? I can't see what you can see. Abby, see Abby, Abby. Abby. Mrs. Hurlbut. Um, yeah, my concern would be that if you have the special town meeting um, too close to Labor Day, uh, that you will have missed an opportunity during September and October to get the word out and, and uh, educate the public. So I, I am concerned if you should decide to have the special town meeting too early in the season. People don't remember things that they were told in the spring. And people are too busy in the summer to pay any attention. Um, so, Madam Chair, to you, I believe Mrs. Hurlbut was expressing her concern at, at us having a special town meeting too close to, to Labor Day. And I, I, I don't want to speak for Mr. O'Leary or Mr. Studo, but I think we are in agreement that it's going to probably be after the October town meeting. Right. I can assure you <laughs> yeah. that it will be after the October town meeting. It'll be after October 3rd. Yeah. Anything else, Mrs. Hurlbut? All set? No. Okay. Thank you. Any, are there any other questions or comments by anyone that is joining? Any other comments? But, no, I'm not seeing any online, Madam Chair. All right, so we should do a, we have a motion. Madam Chair, in accordance with the Town of North Reading Charter Section 
dash four dash one. I move to set the dates for the 2022 town meeting as follows. Monday, June 6, 2022. Monday, October 3rd, 2022. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those are set. Stay tuned for more updates on sewer and notice of a, a virtual hearing on warrant articles in advance of the in person. Okay, next order of business is a vote to sign a letter of intent to explore feasibility with State 911 Department, the North Shore Regional 911 Center, Mr. O'Leary. I mean, uh, Mr. Gilbert, no, looking at you. <laughs> Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Just very briefly, this has been an item that's been identified over a variety of years in budget presentations and in um, strategic planning workshops, uh, both through the lens of looking at opportunities to regionalize but also opportunities to operate our public safety departments uh, more efficiently. And so there is an opportunity um, for us to explore a letter of intent for a feasibility study um, with the state 911 department to look at whether their regional 911 center at, uh, located at the Middleton uh, Sheriff's Office but operated by state 911 could uh, feasibly accommodate the town of North Reading. A uh, study is conducted at the expense of State 911 department, we may need to provide them some information through that process. Um, and really, our, our you know my uh, goal here is to start that process uh, and to have that review done. Um, you know, we have had com <coughs> multiple conversations, meaning the two chiefs and I, about this. I think that we are stand unified that you know the ideal would be exploring and being able to stand up our own um, dedicated um, 911 dispatch center here. That is something that we've looked at in prior years and some of the board members have been part of those conversations. It is very expensive and costly, which is why we just feel we need to do our due diligence and then uh, intend to come back to the board with um, some information about what options you can consider at a later point in time. Um, tonight's conversation is not about committing to going down a path. It's about uh, determining whether that path is feasible um, at this stage. And so State 911 asks for uh, the chief elected officials to approve, which is why we put this forward. Thank you, and I, we are joined by our fire chief and our police chief, who are also our public safety director. Is there anything else you want to add to well, either one of you? That seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward, Madam Chair, and, and I think it's the right move to make for the town just to explore that possibility of going forward. And just for me, I support the study. I think the results are needed as we evaluate our emergency dispatch operations. Any other questions, comments? And that's not costing us anything. No. Correct. All right. Do we have a? Do we have a? Um, There's a motion. Motion. Madam Chair, I move someone, to. I thought I saw someone's hand no. raised. Madam <laughs> Chair, I move to approve. <laughs> The letter of intent to explore feasibility with the state 911 department, North Shore Regional 911 Center, and to authorize the chair to sign the letter. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 If this was an auction, you would have just lost something. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our next order of business is the hazard mitigation plan where we're going to be reviewing it and uh, they take a vote to adopt. That's correct, um, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, fire chief is here and he has served as the uh, facilitator of our hazard mitigation plan process. Um, the plan's hundreds of pages long, so we're not going to go through it in, uh, in detail here this evening. But for those who may recall, we actually went through a pretty detailed review in either 2016 or 2018 at a public meeting. So I, I felt that it was necessary at this stage where it's, you know, it's an update to that plan. The fire chief has prepared a, a brief presentation to take us through with a few slides, just giving you the update of, on what's changed in the plans. Chief, I have that on my computer here, unless right. you've got it already up there. Nope, that's fine. Uh, and I will uh, share my screen. And let's, and let me just say, too, it, it's a couple hundred pages. It might take you 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes to read it, but, you know, <laughs> we're going to, should have this posted extremely comprehensive plan so that the citizens can look at this and read through it. Um, and it, it is the result of a pretty intense amount of effort to get this plan. A lot of work 
um, to get the goal accomplished of getting this plan in place. And so that will be made available for our North Reading citizens to read and review it too. That is correct. It should be posted on the town's website. It, it is not right, Jim. Yeah, it should be. Oh, it's reversed over here. So. Yeah. Thanks. I'm looking behind me, but I can't see it. Thank you. Chief Stats. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just again, like uh, the town minister said, this is just a brief overview of the hazard, hazard mitigation plan in case you're unfamiliar with what that is. Um, it's a plan developed to reduce loss of life and property by minimizing the impact of disasters and to identify natural disasters, risks, and vulnerabilities that are common to the town, and to develop long-term strategies for, for protecting people and property from those risks. Um, the plan has been uh, initially in existence since 2011 and updated in 2016, and again, needs to be updated in 2021. It's good for five years, and then it's required to be reviewed and updated. So one of the big questions is, is it required? And that's, uh, that's a yes and no answer. By law, it, it is not required. We don't need to have one. However, if you want to collect money from the federal government, it is required. So FEMA requires that to collect funding under uh, 44 CFR uh, 201, which is mitigation planning, that the local governments uh, prepare and uh, review every five years a, a hazard mitigation plan for the town that addresses those, those issues. So the plan allows for federal and state reimbursement of pre-disaster grant funding uh, under all sections of the following programs that I have listed here, uh, which are also under that section, but briefly, uh, Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, the Building Resi Resilient Infrastructure Program, Fire uh, Management Assistance Program, and the Public Assistance Grant Program that we recently have taken advantage of through the pandemic. Uh, and the Rehabilitation of High Hazard Potential Dam Grant Program, which really doesn't affect us too much. However, to be able to recoup any kind of federal money, we need to have a, this plan approved by FEMA and on file with them. So the process that we went through, uh, once we realized that we had to update this plan, uh, was to request a, uh, put out a request for a proposal through a consultant. And that contract was awarded to Jamie Kaplan Consulting with Northampton Mass, who really spearheaded this and took us through this process and made it very painless, so to speak, for us. Um, we developed uh, a core team at that time to, to identify all the community hazards and risks. We, re we, re excuse me, we reviewed the past hazard mitigation plan and the MVP, which have similar um, risk assessments. We, uh, after the um, core team was developed, we held multiple meetings, and we had two public meetings that the public was able to comment on and, and bring up some of my, their ideas, which several did. At that point, the draft plan was circulated and reviewed by the core team and made available to the public for public review. It was then submitted to FEMA, who reviewed it, approved it preliminarily, and then submitted to FEMA. FEMA found that it met all of the uh, required elements of 44 CFR section 201. And now it's back here at the local level for the board to adopt. At that point, if you choose to adopt it, it will be resubmitted with the adoption paperwork to FEMA, who will then submit a letter back to the town stating that you now have a certified plan on file with FEMA and we're eligible for grant funding and different programs at that time. Okay. Do we have any questions? Is that, does that, is that the end of your presentation? That is. All right. <laughs> Fastest presentation ever. Fastest slideshow ever. <laughs> time time okay. to look for a budget meetings. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions? Mr. Walmart. Just one. You went through all this work. Uh, what upgrades did you make that we should be aware of? So some of the upgrades that we made was basically a review of the 2016 plan. And we made and updated that with some of the projects that had been completed, some of the projects that have been taken off, or some of the projects that have been basically uh, partially completed and are still pending completion. 
Um, some of those are, examples are uh, the stormwater bylaw, which was updated, the coordination with the USGS service and the Ip Ipswich River watershed to access and install monitors at key locations, and the critical equipment move from the floodplain to the DPW garage. Those are examples of the projects that have been completed. We were able to update that plan to show that. And again, we have a whole list of them that are in different stages or have been removed. Right. So that's that's what we've done. So it's a good exercise at the end of the day. What's that? It's a good exercise at the end of the day. Yeah, it certainly it? is. And uh, it, it kind of holds us to to task and, and make sure that we stay focused on some of those some of those projects that could serve that could help the town. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? I, I do have one. It actually goes back, and once again, to Mr. Ev Mr. Evans' point. One of the things that is noted in here as a low priority item is a um, an emergency kind of an emergency response team. Which, you know, I know what he was mentioning pandemic, and these are other types of hazards, but having a preparedness plan like that and an emergency response team. Why is that a low priority? Because I think that would, should be, I know we have specific people and personnel in place to address these things, but wouldn't a, a, a more broader emergency management team in the town be a good idea in terms of addressing? It is a good idea. I think it was vetted as a lower priority only because some of the other projects are, are more important to the town that the, the core team felt. Um, the emergency planning team that you're looking at has been looked at through the EMG process and is still one of the projects that we want to complete, but we have to get certain things in place first as far as requirements and training for citizens that would volunteer for that team. That was my next question. So in my mind, I would think of an emergency management team of the town as being our public safety people. Not that you don't have a lot on your plate already, but our DPW director, our Public sir, you know, public. Sir. I would think the board of health director. That would be kind of our own emergency management core team. And I understand you're already doing those functions as it is, but on a basically on a regular basis, just for preparedness plan, it would seem like that would be a good idea to just kind of keep this rolling and keep <coughs> the, the goals of this plan on target, even if it's a long term, ten years down the line keeping it on target. Is that a thought to maybe, in, in addition to that, getting citizen, citizen involvement on that? It is, and, and as you've already identified, we do have that core team and we meet weekly and sometimes, oh, okay. sometimes several times a week to discuss, just depends on the issues at hand, okay. and then we decide how we're gonna handle that, so which is, which is I think, really efficient uh, way to do business here. So the CERT team that was identified in the plan is basically supplementation by a citizen to help okay. us meet some of those needs. Um, yeah. That would be a year down the line? Or? Uh, I think we're looking conservatively in three to five years just to get the program in place, embedded, approved, and the people trained. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Gonzalez. I'm just curious about that. As far as citizens, how do you go about getting to the, those people who volunteer for it? Correct. So we put it out, volunteer, we'd have to make sure that uh, through background, a background check process that they can work uh, for the town and then put up a training plan and, and goals that we want to achieve to make sure that they stay certified. Because at that point, you know, where police and fire go through ongoing continuing education process, we need to make sure that citizen volunteers would be safe too and establish some kind of program to make sure that they would meet ongoing requirements to stay certified in certain aspects that we'd ask them to perform. Are there towns around us that are already implementing that? I believe some towns do have CERT teams in place. Uh, so I've recently started to attend some uh, regional uh, emergency management uh, meetings, uh, and I can explore that further. Is that the training that, that NEMA does, or you do, or both? It's, FEMA does? It would be a combination of both. So both FEMA and FEMA do put out training. We just have to see when they would offer that training. And then if they didn't, we would have to supplement in, in lieu of that. Okay. 
or in conjunction with at times. All right. Are we all set for questions? Good. Well, thanks. Thank you for the presentation and, and all the work that's done. Yeah, I'd really like to recognize the core team again for their time and effort in doing this because it was a pretty big task and I think it went fairly, very smoothly and I really need to uh, recognize uh, Jamie Kemp for consulting as well. Who else, while well, you have, well, who else served on this? Sure, the DPW director, the deputy chief of the fire department, Lieutenant Joe Thibodeau from the police department, uh, the building superintendent, Mark Hamill, uh, Mark Clark from the water department, Bob Race from the Health Department, Bob Collins from Human Resources. Um, they were the crux of that core team and really streamlined the process, made it pretty efficient and, and pleasurable to work with. All right, so do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to adopt the updated hazard mitigation plan. Second. Dated November 2021. Second. Sorry. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we are on to our next order of business, which is to review the potential changes to the solid waste program for FY 2023. Madam Chair, through you, we have a two-phase presentation for, for this evening. Um, the first phase will be <coughs> some slides uh, that Recycling Committee member uh, Daniel Ruberg, who is joining us via Zoom, um, will go through, and then um, that will be followed by uh, some slides that Water Superintendent Mark Clark will, uh, will walk through. Uh, I would note that DPW Director Joe Parisi has put a substantial amount of time into this uh, as has finance director Liz Rourke um, due to an unexpected change in travel plans Mr. Parisi is not able to join us here this evening but uh, as you all know um, Mr. Clark is very much uh, in tune with and familiar with our program and is more than capable of walking through the presentation um, but through you Madam Chair if we could start with Mr. Greenberg Dan do you have the slides there you, I have them here right Dan can you hear me Yes, I can. And so I have the slides on the, the presentation laptop here. You want me to put them up on the screen? Uh, in a moment, I just have a brief introduction, if I may. Certainly. Uh, and I know you're speaking loudly. If you could speak a little louder for us, that would be great. Okay. Can you, can you hear me now? That's better. Okay. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dan Greenberg. I've been a resident of North Reading since 1983. And I'm a member of the Recycling Committee and the liaison between the Recycling Committee and the DPW. For the past year, we have been working uh, hard in conjunction with uh, the DPW and our Municipal Assistance Coordinator, Gail Garone, at DEP to review our solid waste disposal plan that we have come up with the recommendations it's only two pages, but that, those two pages, and I assume everybody is, the members of the board have seen that, um, although it's only two pages, it doesn't reflect the amount of time and effort, I think, that everybody involved has put into this, and we're very confident about it. Um, I just briefly would like to review sort of where we are with our solid waste disposal plan in North Reading, how we got here, and then briefly I'll discuss what our recommendations are. If you, if you could go to the slide two, um, the play with current programs. All of these slides, by the way, were uh, a, a part of a slide deck that was presented in the 2014 town meeting by the former chairperson of the recycling committee, Ed McGrath. Um, briefly, where we are is we have a curbside pickup with ostensibly a maximum amount per week of two 35-gallon barrels. In addition to that, we have curbside, unlimited curbside recycling. Um, at present, uh, we are disposing of approximately one ton per household per year. Um, we do about 4,500 tons per year overall. That comes down to about a ton per household. Um, a lot of trash. There are, 
I'm sorry? That's a lot of trash. Yes, it is, and we'd like to do something about that. Um, so, just briefly, when I first moved to town, we had a town dump. Um, somewhere between 1983 and 2000, I forget the exact date, we went to, we had a pay as you throw program where people had to go either to the town hall or to a store and purchase stickers that they would put on their own trash bag. Um, and I, I forget what it was, I think it was two and I forget what the amount was. Um, there was uh, some resistance in town to that um, for two reasons. One, everybody in town every week had to go buy some stickers. And two, because you had to go and buy stickers to get rid of any trash, there was some level of illegal dumping that um, ensued. So in 2008, the plan was changed to um, limit curbside pickup, to do away with the pay to throw, do away with the stickers. And initially there was a limit of four 30-gallon barrels. Um, and there was an annual trash fee, and then it was $226, now it's $75 of order. We instituted the unlimited recycling program. Then in 2013, we reduced the number of barrels that were allowed to three 35-gallon barrels. And in 2014, we went down to the current two 35-gallon barrels. Now, there are a couple of problems presented by that. Um, first and foremost, there was no um, plan for overflow trash. As a result, even though we went from four to three to two barrels, um, there is a small minority of people in town who never got down to two barrels. It's Seventy percent of the people in town actually only use one barrel or less, um, but there's another 30 percent, another 20 some odd percent that use two barrels, and there's about six percent that use three or four barrels. Oftentimes, the heavy users are using much larger barrels than the 35 gallon barrels. And as I say, that was because there was no provision made to deal with overflow. So when we went from four to three to two, people who were using three or four barrels had no place to put their trash. So they continued to use those barrels. Um, and for that reason, there really was a lack of enforcement of these limits. Um, and, and now pretty much people can put out, are putting out as much as they want without a limitation. Um, and there are a couple problems with that that we want to address. One is that there's no um, incentives to divert from the solid waste stream, which is problematic from an environmental point of view, but to divert to the recycling bins or to composting or to reuse or some other environmentally fa uh, uh, favorable method of, of, of getting rid of the trash. Um, second reason is it's just not fair. Um, the example I always use is there's a elderly woman, she's in her 90s, and lives next door to me. She lives by herself, and she puts out about a half of a garbage bag every other week for trash, and she doesn't do recycling. Um, she pays the same amount as there's somebody up the street for me, I think he may be a contractor, I don't know, but who eventually puts out three or four 60 or 96 gallon barrels. Those two people pay their same fee and that, that's just not equitable, it's just not fair. So in order to address those two problems, what we propose is a pay-as-you-throw program for overflow. So we would, we, what we're recommending is strict enforcement of the two 35 gallon barrel rule. It's been in for, it's been there since 2014. People may complain that there's been a lack of enforcement, but the rule has been there, it's been published, it's been advertised, um, and we think you need to have strict enforcement of that in order to encourage the diversion of solid waste trash for recycling, composting, et cetera. And then, what we would do is we would make overflow bags available at various locations for the town at a cost of approximately $2.50 per bag. Um, and again, this would only, under current usage, they, it's only about 6% of the households would be 
required to, to buy these bags, and they're the heavy users. So it's not as burdensome as the original Pantheon Hill program by any means, and it does institute this element of, of equity. Um, so uh, if we could go to uh, slide um, seven, you, you will see um, Okay, you will see that the amount of, of solid waste trash that we've been disposing of really has stayed steady since 2009. And one of the interesting things is we were steadily reducing ostensibly the number of barrels that people could put out. But again, because there was no provision for overflow trash, the, the amount of trash we were disposing of um, did not appreciably go down. And it's, I find it a matter of interest. DEP rates every town by the amount of trash that they get rid of, uh, that they dispose of, solid waste trash, per household per year. There are 10 categories, and North Reading has perpetually been in the next uh, worst category. We, again, we average about a ton a year. Their, their scale goes from 750 pounds to 2,251 pounds, we're in the 2,000 to 2,250 range, second worst on their list. Um, and what we aim to do is to get a reduction in the amount of trash per household that's disposed of and convert it to more environmentally friendly uh, uh, methods. Um, so our proposal to mediate that by strict enforcement of the two-gallon rule and um, the provision for overflow bags. And my, one of my last comments, if you look at, um, look, I, I, I don't need the slides anymore, actually. Um, I don't know if people have any questions. Um, I think I explained it. And um, we, we urge the, the board to adopt this new plan with a few actually you can do go to um, slides five. Excuse me, seven. Is that seven, Dan? Yeah, well, the point is that uh, we have to reduce the amount of solid waste trash uh, every town goes to an incinerator in Adderall, and that includes things like uh, batteries that, that put, off, uh, put out um, a toxic gas that come out of the smokestacks. Um, and it's, it's time that we, that we find an effective means of reducing the amount of trash that goes into that stream and increasing the amount that goes into uh, more environmentally favorable. Um, Mr. Greenberg, so the, Mr. Yes. Greenberg, can you hear me? So it would yes. the the recommendation is to keep to so to keep the trash fee that's being across the board for everybody with the two barrels, and then for households that want to dispose of more than the two barrels they would buy the trash bags and leave them out with the barrels for pickup. <clears throat> that is correct. Okay. And where, where are the trash barrels to be sold? Bags. I mean, not bags, bags. You mean the bags? Yeah. Bags. Um, we, 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 uh, as, as was done with the original plan, we would, uh, uh, solicit the uh, cooperation of stock and shop, convenience stores, liquor stores. Um, uh, we, we anticipate uh, 10 or 12 possible outlets. I don't think, I think it's fair to say that of the 6% of households that will need to go buy the bags, everybody, somebody in that household at least once a week goes to one of those stores. So we don't think it would be terribly burdensome. Um, to, to ask those people who are the heavy users to make a stop, they could buy 
several bags at a time so they don't have to go every week. And also, one other question for you is the money that's paid for the bags, is that shared between the town and the store, or does that come to the town to offset the cost of, to offset the cost of um, the, the pickup? A good, a good question. Um, uh, no, they, they, at about 250, that covers the town's cost of acquiring the bags, and then part of that goes towards uh, the average trash bag, according to DEP, holds 27 pounds of trash. We pay $90 a ton tipping fee to Cavanta for all the solid waste trash. So if you do the math, the additional tipping fee for an average 27 pound overflow bag added to the cost of the bag comes to about $2.50. So, um, and, and one of the, the big advantages is, 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 is that we do reduce, by doing this, we will be reducing, hopefully, the um, tipping fees that we pay. Um, and to the extent that there are heavy users, they will be paying their fair share to that overflow trash. Now, that will make the program revenue positive. And what we suggest is that um, the, this, hopefully we're going to reduce the amount of trash so we're going to have an overall reduction in tipping fees, plus we're going to have the revenue from the bags, and the plan is that that would hopefully, at the very least, offset any future increases in the quarterly fee, and maybe even allow for a reduction in that fee um, to maintain revenue neutrality. And what we're also suggesting is that this is a temporary step and that the final step would be um, after people get used to uh, this program to reduce the number of allowed barrels from two to one, um, which is the DEP standard. And by doing that, you would become eligible for DEP pays you throw grants in the neighborhood of forty to fifty thousand dollars a year that we can use to subsidize uh, the purchase of um, smaller barrels for those people who are using 60 and 96 gallon barrels. Mr. O'Leary. First of all, Dan, uh, to you, your committee, and part of the administration that's been uh, working with you for a long period of time, and our liaison, so we'll put in a lot of time on this. You know, we appreciate it, the effort and the, uh, and the report to, to the board and your suggestions. My question is, um, where will and do you foresee uh, the fairness issue being addressed in a monetary standpoint for the lady next door to you, you know, who puts a one bag every two weeks or half a bag every two weeks. You know, how how do you foresee us addressing that fairness issue? Or can we? As I have said, as I said um, the revenue from the sale of the bags um, plus the uh, savings on tipping fees as we reduce the amount of trash that is taken to the Covant incinerator, um, that that money can be used to reduce the fixed fee, but not the cost of the overflow bags. So that will create financial equity. The real, the real uh, push for equity will come when you go from two barrels to one, because now you really are saving quite a bit on the tipping fees. And that money can be used either, as I say, to alleviate future increases in the quarterly fee, or to actually reduce it. And bear in mind, the lady next door isn't buying overflow bags. No, but so she's, she's cost, also she's paying three hundred dollars a uh, year, though. So it's well, <laughs> okay. That you know, uh, 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 Mr. Caperto quite artfully a year ago explained how that was calculated, um, and it's you know the town has to maintain revenue neutrality, doesn't it? No, 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 I, I understand that. I just didn't know if there was anything in the equation, you know, where we could assist those people, uh, particularly, you know, single households and particularly senior households with you know, one or two people who are low, low generators of trash, um, you know. Was there any discussion or any uh, anticipated uh, modification to the plan to allow for low-end users 
an adjusted fee. You know, and again, this is, uh, this is obviously going to generate more money. But as you reduce the number of, of pounds of trash that are covered by the quarterly fee, you increase the revenue from the sale of the overflow bags and you reduce the tipping fees. So if you reduce the quarterly fee, the lady next door gets a much bigger percentage break than the person up the street that's buying, putting out two barrels and buying several overflow bags. This is step one. Yeah. I, I, no, 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 I agree. No, no, there I, is again. a long-term plan, and this is step one to get yeah. it in. Okay. Great. That's no, again, I applaud your efforts and appreciate it very much. And and, and, and I say right now I'm in support of what's being advocated for here. Okay. Well, you, you, you can always, as a separate matter, you can always have some kind of cost mitigation program um, for low-income people, for example, to reduce their quarterly fees, but that's not within the scope of the proposal. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Studo. Um, good evening, Mr. Greenberg. I just have, I have a question and then a question. I just, uh, can you give me the numbers again to um, the single double barrel? I know 6% use more than the two, but can you give me the ones for the single and double, please? Um, the 70% um, of households use one or fewer barrels. 70% okay. of the households okay. at present are only using one or less barrels. Um, approximately 20% are using two barrels and about 6% are using three or more. Okay. So, um, well, the question I have in general, I mean, you know, it's always a monetary thing, right? Um, I don't know what screen to look at. Um, but the main thing I see is, and I appreciate it, you, you've brought up the equity and the fairness, but it's something where we have to sell this, right? So in my opinion, out of the 90% that use at least one, maybe fewer like you said or two i can say from a convenience standpoint alone i bet you i can get at least 60 70 percent to come in here and say they like it the way it is i'm just being honest here because i know that like everybody brings up how we want but i'm just i'm just trying to be honest that i'm looking at it and again from last year if i remember the presentation correctly and from friends of mine in other towns we still pay peanuts compared to every surrounding town here because i got the numbers and oh, I've brought that. But what I'm trying to say is, though, that, again, I appreciate what you're saying, but I know that in this town right now, the vast majority from a convenience only will pay $300 to not have to go to the store even once. So my thing is that, again, I know it's a pilot program if we want to put that term. I just feel like, as Ms. Benny Pelli said, maybe this is step one, but maybe someone or you can answer the question. I don't see how this is step one to something further because I just don't, if this is the starting step, then I, I think that step two is gonna be step one again. But Mr. Mr. Studo, though, this isn't eliminating the fee or eliminating the ability to use two barrels. It's just- Correct. It's oh, I, no, no, I understand yeah. that that's not, no, no, but hold on, the, then maybe I wasn't clear. That, that wasn't the question. I, I know we're not eliminating it, but I'm saying that, again, like a lot of things, are we doing this just to pat ourselves in the back that we're doing something to try to see what the problem is that maybe 300 is too much that's fine but i mean is it realistic because if it's not but if it's not realistic then i feel like telling i i just don't see where the numbers work even long term here maybe maybe someone can explain it to me because mrs smith throws away one Please bear in mind that 90% of the household won't ever have to buy an overflow bag. Oh, I, I, I agree, but what I'm just trying to say is that the purpose of this pilot program, right, is to see, is to get a little revenue to, to cause a little bit of pain, right? So that person maybe we can do things a little better, like I do a lot of recycling, right? Or I would have five barrels out there, I'll tell you the truth. So it, thank God I can recycle what I can. So I'm just trying to see, the again, can someone tell me what step two is? Can I, can I just advance this? Oh, 
Mr. Greenberg, I'm going to just let Mr. Gonzalez address Mr. Studo's question, and then I'll, we'll come back to you if you have any more to comment. Uh, Mrs. Gonzalez. So nothing changes except for the people who are abusing it, which is costing us more. Mm -hmm. So the people who are throwing extra stuff out there beyond their two barrels, it's getting picked up because we're telling them to pick it up because we don't want it left all over town. So we're paying for that. It's extra money that we have to pay for as a town. This will stop it because now you're going to put extra stuff out. You need to go get your bag or we're not picking it up. So, okay. so it's going to deter those people putting that extra stuff out that we're having to pay extra for. Okay. If that helps. So that clarifies, it does. So I can summarize in my head that it's to deter those, but I just heard a lot about, I, I'm just, when the word equity gets said 12 times, I counted, that just makes me feel that this, we're trying to get somewhere where we're trying to help that 90 year old lady, but it seems to me that that's not what this will accomplish at all. No, that's not, that the, no, but that, let's just do that. Am I missing something? Yes, you are. Because I don't think I am, I think, I think it's just being ladies, rephrased. The little old ladies throwing out a tiny bag. I agree. And she so I understand if, that. If we're moving forward in a concerted plan, moving forward, the larger throwers away of trash, I'm not going to say they're abusers, but the larger people that throw away more trash will bear more of the cost of the throwing away of the trash. And that's where equity comes in. I, I just... But I'm not, but no, because in, okay, I, I see what you're saying and I get the point. I think you're just missing what I'm saying. I agree with you there as well, Mr. Greenberg, about that 250, it's going to help us and what Mrs. Gonzalez said. However, at the end, I've done some quick math in my head and that 6%, even if they kept paying and were willing to pay the pain, it's just going to cover our extra cost. But again, I'm just, I'm asking the question of the people in the committee how do we get to helping the 90-year-old lady who's just throwing out, you know, uh, the small, I, I, I just, I'm just asking. Well, this is the question Mr. O'Leary has, and this is the question we've posed over and over again when this topic comes up, is what can we do to address that? And I, and I just wanted to go through that exercise, though, that that 250 is just to mitigate our extra cost. So my thing is, I want to know if it's there, I don't want to surprise. I want to know if there's some internal number that I'm not being told of what it's actually going to cost to make sure that the 90-year-old lady doesn't pay 300 a year. If we don't have that number, fine. But until we have that number, I, I really... I, I have the number. Okay, so how much is it? Okay. If you go to the single bear, you, you will have, um, you will reduce the county's cost of disposing of the solid waste trash by twelve dollars per quarter per household. Now you can apply that twelve dollars against future potential increases in that cost, or you could reduce the quarterly fee. And that helps the little old lady because her cost goes down where by a greater percentage than the person up the street that's using four barrels. Okay. And then do you have an analysis of if, if the same kind of trash consumption was being done, you know, by that household. And, and again, are we, how certain are we of that 70% using one or fewer? Is that a solid number? It's a, that's a dead solid number based on actual on the ground surveys, not just in North Reading, but throughout the state done by DEP. Okay, so, so the question is then, how much the delta, how much the extra is going to be for that 20%, right? Because that's a bigger population, or 24. I mean, granted, there's some. All right. I'm just trying to figure that out because, again, I, as you can imagine, because of my age group, I am part of that age group. And by the way, you guys can go by my house. I never have more than one barrel, ever. So, fact. And everyone can drive by my house every day. So, but. I can tell you that in my age group, a lot, pretty much everybody I know falls in that 26%. And probably everybody else, but I mean, I, again, when I get asked, I just want a good answer. Because 
because don't worry about it, I'll tell you later, that's not, that doesn't work for me. Okay. Mr. Yes, uh, Mr. Did you have to ask you people to pay their fair share? I don't understand the problem. Okay, Mr. Mr. Greenberg, we're just gonna, Mr. Wanna wants to provide some input too. Please, Mr. Wanna. Okay, so um, I've been thinking about this a lot and I've been thinking about this since I was in eighth grade. Uh, so wow. <laughs> that's a lot of fun. That's a lot. That's my first that's a lot of fun. <laughs> How do you like that? You've got all that room in that cranium <laughs> paying attention. <laughs> that's a lot of ideas. <laughs> yeah, I have nothing else better to do. <laughs> no, he, here's the one big thing we're missing is, uh, you know, we've said it, you actually said it in the slides, and I think the recycling committee is doing the best you can under the situation. And I really actually fully support going to the one barrel because that is 70% of the population. Let's skip that for a second. We already, we've had continuing abuses going on readily. JRM, you can encourage them to not pick up more than two barrels, but they drive by them and they pick them up. And you can encourage them not to, to pick up anything else but 35 gallon barrels, and they're gonna pick up the 60 somethings and they're gonna pick up the 90 somethings because that's what they do. Whatever we do, we should be thinking about the people who are doing this work, picking it up day after day, because if they don't implement it and support it, and we don't keep it simple, and this is probably with high turnover, all of this is great in theory, but it doesn't mean anything, because we have to make it simple, and we have to make it that they can do this and implement it, because the abuses will continue just like they always have since 2014, is what I just heard. They're gonna continue on, and this is all gonna be great theory that doesn't have any application to reality. And so my question is, is have we gone to JRM to, to understand why we haven't had compliance from them in picking that up? And what program do they like that would actually be simple enough for their people to remember? And because they go to more communities than just to us. They go to other communities, they have to remember all the special rules. We shouldn't have special rules. We should have very standardized, very simple rules that we can implement. If you said it was to me how to make that simple, one barrel, 35 gallons, no exceptions, except that you have the stickers that go on it. You've taken care of 70% of your people to drive your rate down, and the other 30% who are doing more, they can put stickers on. If they want to do 65 gallons, they have to. You've got to keep it simple, but the bottom line is, it's the people who are picking up week after week. If they aren't following your rules, this is all just really a waste of time, like it's been since 2014. Okay, I, I have an answer for that. Please. There are 155 communities in Massachusetts that have already adopted similar payments and parole programs, and they all seem to be working. The reason, J, including JRM communities, by the way, the reason JRM isn't enforcing the due barrel limit is they have been given no guidance from the town They've been given no instruction to it to enforce that rule. In fact, historically what's happened is the few people that bother to call town hall in advance of a uh, Tuesday pickup and say, well, I had a special problem. I'd like to put out more than two barrels. They're, they have been told 100% of the time, no problem. So if you tell JRM to enforce the rule, they know how to do it. They're doing it. You know, they and other callers are doing it 155 other communities. We're, okay. we're the ones who have created a problem by creating exceptions? Yeah, we're the ones that created the problem by not enforcing the rules we like set. We've told them not, we told them to pick it up. Don't do that. So well, because we want a clean community. Right, right. And, and there wasn't an option. There wasn't a, now there's an option. So now we can say, you should have bought the bag. We're not going to pick it up. We can tell them. <coughs> Correct, Mr. Gilberto? Yeah. We've chosen to not do that because there wasn't another option. And correct, we didn't want trash everywhere. There isn't going to be an option now with I, these bags. So if you didn't purchase the bags and you're putting out an extra barrel, it's, we can now, they will not pick it up if we tell them not to. And then they're going to call the DPW to come and get the barrel and say, JRM didn't get my barrel, and then the DPW is going to pick it up. This, hold on. This, and then we have two yeah. hands raised, so this we're going to so, so I'll just finish. 
I'll oh. just finish my comment. Oh, excuse me. Uh, no, it's okay. Mark. It's all right. I, I have a lot more comments. Eighth grade. He's yeah, we got to think about that. We were <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish we could be going in this back and forth. Any proposal you make, if we don't, if we don't have high assurance that JRM is going to going to actually support it, then I don't see how anything can they work, will. right? Okay, so that's, I mean, that's really important. And I think that, not even for the little old lady, for the people who, like, we have three people in our household, we put out one barrel. I mean, it's always been consistent, right? And it's usually not full. So, um, you know, it, it, it would seem like we should just, why, why go from step one to step two? Why not just go to the one barrel? That makes a lot of sense to me. And then the people who have to put out more, they buy the stickers, and you wouldn't be going every week. I used to buy stickers. You'd buy a half year's worth. I mean, I, I don't like to go Just to Just to be store. clear, it's not a sticker. It's a bag. Oh, it's literally a bag. Whatever. It's literally a bag. Okay, so you buy a bag. And you don't need it for your regular trash, only for your excess. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah So it's different it. than the sticker program, okay. <clears throat> which was all your trash. It's big enough to hold the 35 gallons of? It's a, it's a bag. 35 gallon bag. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh that's look it. at that. Ah, there we, we have go. an example. Oh. Yeah, but if you're gonna, if, if we're gonna consider having the number of barrels, we would need to have the number of, have the charge, and I don't think that's the goal here is to try to get some sort of surplus before we try to make any major program change. But if if you're proposing that, I would propose either doing away with the trash fee or having it if you're taking one of the two barrels away. From I don't buy those numbers. With the amount of tonnage per household, I don't buy that 90% of the people are putting one barrel out or one bag. Yeah, I don't no buy one. that. Like so 70, 70%. 70%. 70%. 70, 70, 70. What? So. I, that still, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense unless there's a bunch of contractors putting out 17 barrels a week. It doesn't well, make a lot of sense. I just see, just in my own neighborhood, driving around town, first of all, there are a significant number of people who don't just use the 30 gallon, 32 gallon barrels. There's huge barrels out there. There are huge barrels. Huge barrels out there that, that are being utilized and they put two or three or four out. Uh, so, so the barrels are, are not all equal. And um, you know, the, the tonnage is what it is. I, 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 I would say that 70% probably is the one barrel <coughs> benchmark. But uh, again, the other 30% you know, is are two barrels or more plus the, the big, big users at 6%. So, I don't know, it's just, uh, you know, to me, I think, first thing is barrel enforcement is huge. Yeah. I mean, because there are barrels in my neighborhood, there are two to one ratio, pretty darn close, you know, two to one ratio. And you know, so we should tell JRM, tell the public, you know, these are the barrels that you, that are allowed to be picked up. Sorry if you went out and you purchased these other ones or you stole them from the home you owned in Malden or wherever it was. With the, I mean, some, I don't know how they, some, some of these trash guys pick some of these things up because they're made for machinery for, yeah. you know, to, to utilize. But anyway, uh, you know, so <coughs> size of the barrel enforcement, two barrel limit enforcement, and then off of the, the, the overflow bags, which again is the same size as the barrels. You know, then you're going to sort through things here as far as, uh, right. you know, Who's using what? Maybe right. using some of that surplus to create, a, a, <coughs> I guess, a kind of yeah, readjust. Why when you're yeah. when you only use half a bag and you leak or something? Yeah. All right, okay. So Thank you. Three hands up now, and let let's Mr. Studer, Mr. So, Waller. I'm right? all set. Thank you very much. Mr. Studer. So sorry. Excuse me. Um, you sure go back to a point I made. I, I I'm with you. There's no way 26% are doing all that. Um, also, I've seen the 35 gallons because I think they use them in Malden. My parents have them. Yeah, no one has them here. Everybody has bigger ones, fact. So I'm just saying that you impose a 35 gallon and in my opinion, that 70% that's using one goes to two. But they're gonna pay. They're gonna pay. But that's more importantly why I think this has to be discussed bigger before we ever went down to even one because I feel and this is just my opinion, but I, I've been told the town meeting rules. I think you can get enough people if they start finding out that all of a sudden they have to start doing two barrels and then go to stop and shop and then do this and then be, and, and again, it's, I understand it's about trying to lower the cost to be fair, but we have to acknowledge what North Reading is and it just, 
I'm just trying to say that it's going to come down to the money, and I think that if if this becomes a bigger thing where it seems like throwing out the trash is going to be one big pain in the you you know what every week, and then God forbid I have people over in December and I forgot to buy bags, I got to run to the store, you know. On I'm just I'm just trying to say it's not a good reason not to do it, but just I feel that it should be a bigger dialogue. Right, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. And I think that, I don't think it's as simple as, we can enforce it, right? Go down to one barrel, 35 gallon, and I guarantee you that you're gonna have to hire someone new from the VPW called Complaint Department for Trash. Because it's no one here that's gonna have to deal with it. It's gonna have to be the DPW have you those that calls? deals that's with it. That's why we're not going up. We're yeah, not going up. No, no, but I think we're even, not going away. I'm just saying that, doesn't decide this. Side. this. And, you know, it's just something where, again, I'm not saying that someone who uses more shouldn't pay more. And I grew up in Malden where we, we, we bought the bags. I bought bags. So I, I'm part of that. What you've been dreaming about since eighth grade or since it's been around, I only knew before coming to North Reading. But I also know that it's something where it, it takes, it was a lot different in my opinion. Like here, it seems like people are comfortable with this. And also, let's be honest, last year when we talked about this trash fee, hate to break it to you. Outside of one, we got one person who came to meeting the meeting to complain about it. One. Zero support. Wrote editorials. Put a billboard. Trash is expensive. The idea that it was expensive to throw away trash in North Reading was mocked. Newsflash. So, I'm done. Okay. And I just, just for the mold and the mold and piece of pay as you throw, the, what that program did, it was done away with because it didn't work, but what it did achieve was a higher amount of recycling, right. which was what it was, part of what it was intended to do. And so more people started to be more conscientious about their making, the, making sure they put out a lot of their recycling. And, and that is part also of what the, this c committee is focused in on is our, you know, green efforts too. And not just, you know, a focus in on what the cost is. We, we also have talked with them about the analysis of, well, make people just buy the bags, like the pay as you throw, which didn't work, right? But it was in place for a long time with a lot of complaint and a lot of the same issues with the trash hauler what they did and didn't pick up, you know, all those same issues. But if you compare the cost of a trash fee, one fee paid per year for the specific barrels, is that cost is less than going to buy the trash bags. And we, we've analyzed that. We did this before. We've did, done this over and over again. We've analyzed it. But if you are talking right now, what they're talking about right now is at least generating a way to generate enough to cover the cost of the program because just because you go down to one barrel doesn't mean the costs of hauling aren't going to be static. They keep increasing and we've been having to look at this over and over and over again to make sure that we're collecting enough to cover the cost. And Mr. O'Leary is right, this doesn't go to town meeting. The person that you were talking about said we were unlawfully taxing. Right ourselves and our citizenry, mm -hmm. but that is, there's a, there's a law that permits for this purpose, tra trash removal in the community, there's a law that permits the municipality to charge a fee for that, however the municipality does it. So it isn't an unlawful tax or anything like that that people, or a person was arguing. So, and I think that was addressed at the time. So what, what we're talking about isn't isn't, uh, you know, we're going to keep chipping away and go down to one barrel. We're trying to keep up with the cost because of the tonnage that's thrown away. And that's why the extra bag is a proposal that kind of meets, that balances that out. And then once we are able to may maybe possibly have, we're supposed to collect enough to cover the cost. That's the whole point of the regulate, the law. You can charge it, but you have to make sure that that fee relates to the cost of hauling. We don't, we're not doing that right now because the cost keeps going up. So we need to make sure we're covering that. Then down the line, if we can bring in a program that for the little old lady that, that shouldn't be paying that much money, 
maybe we can think about that and offset her on the little old man's cost by what we've cut, what is we've cut taking to cover the entire program. Yeah. That's what I think is, I'm not gonna put words into Mr. Greenberg's mouth, but that's what I think he's trying to explain to us is this is the first step towards that. And we've always talked about that as a goal. How are we gonna offset for equity purposes someone that doesn't utilize the full benefit of two barrels, who's only throwing one bag out because they're one person generating hardly any trash. We've always talked about that. How do we make it equitable for that user for that trash person who's only throwing a little bit of trash. But, but we do need uniformity in barrels. And again, what you get in, in some of the cities, because they have these haulers that use the, have to use. So the truck, they have to use the same barrels. So everybody's the same when it comes to the uniformity in the barrels. Yeah. You know, what we don't, we don't have that here. And that's an inequity in and of itself in relation to what's a barrel. You know, what's your definition of a barrel? My neighbor's is this and mine is this. You know, so, you know, but again, I applaud everybody's effort here, and I, and I think we're, we're heading in the right direction, and we can't lose sight of the fact that, you know, part of the major goal here is to reduce the, uh, the tonnage and encourage uh, environmentally uh, correct uh, disposal of, of our waste and, you know, and encourage people to do so. And it's sometimes, you know, it's the extra price of the bag that makes people, you know, that clicks the bulb on their head. But other people are just not going to conform anyway. So. Um, but again, environmentally, this is important to do. Uh, Cost-wise, uh, costs are gonna continue to escalate. The question is, how do we make sure that everybody in the neighborhood and on the street is being treated the same? And again, the first thing that I think is um, barrel uniformity size is key. And when you buy a bag, it's the same bag, and it's gonna be a bag that, like every other bag. Otherwise, it's not gonna get picked up. So uh, Again, it's a step in the right direction. It's, it's something that we just start implementing and educating the public on, and uh, a lot of people are gonna have to invest in some new barrels. Also, the barrels will probably be better to pay for because the coyotes are gonna rip that to shred if you have food. Fact, just saying. All right. <laughs> Miss, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get to the three hands that I see of our attendees, but Mr. Clark, can you, you you're, uh, Sure, so <laughs> if, you th if you thought Mr. Stats PowerPoint presentation was quick. You're going to be amazed because we're going to bypass our PowerPoint presentation and go. Just I just want to make a couple of points that we would have made. Mr. Greenberg hit on a lot of the information that was already inc included in our presentation. Um, one to the little old lady. The question to the little old lady: What does implementing the overflow bag do for that person now? And we've done some numbers. Um, if you go back to last year's trash presentation, we anticipated due to the increased cost of JRM and due to the increased tonnage costs that the fee required this year would have to go from $75 a quarter to $80 a quarter. It's only $20 a year, but we anticipate that we should be able to hold the flat fee at $300. So it doesn't save them a whole lot. It saves them that increase in year one of $20 a year. Going to one barrel will not cut in half the trash fee, it absolutely will not. JRM is a fixed cost. Whether you put out one barrel or you put out two barrels, it costs us the same for JRM to come in and pick up the, the trash and the recycling. Cutting the number of barrels doesn't cost cut the JRM cost. What it hopefully does is drive down the tonnage cost. So when Mr. Greenberg said it could save $12 a quarter or $48 a year, that's where that comes in. It's by reducing some of the tonnage costs. We're never going to get to cut the trash fee in half, even if we cut the number of barrels in half. It just seventy percent are already there. We're not. We're not. We're not able to do that. So there is a minor impact to the fees in the current fiscal year um, by going to the to the bags. A couple other things that haven't come up, and there are some changes that are coming down the pike in from DEP relative to the trash program. One has to do with mattresses. So as of November 1st of 2022, mattresses can no longer be disposed of and box springs can no longer be disposed of. Right now, if you want to get rid of one, you can put one out per week. You can call for that one large item or actually I don't think you have to call for that. You can just put it out with your trash. Mattresses and box springs are no longer going to be considered solid waste. They have to be recycled. The town is looking to work with seven other communities that we have an RFP on the street right now to develop a means to deal with that. Our preferred method of dealing that would be like we do with white goods right now, whereas if Mr. Walner, you have a, tra a mattress to put out, we'll have a contract you can call, and you pay either pay them 
vendor directly or the vendor will build the town and we'll send you a, a mattress bill. Um, we're looking into how that is going to work out. I believe the, our, uh, the, the proposals are opening around April 1st, but again, that's for November 1st. Another thing that's including in that is textiles are no longer supposed to be disposed of as trash. So textiles, your used clothing, your pocketbooks, whatever you have, shoes. Currently there are obviously a lot of box vendors that you can go and dispose of those at. We're also considering, I think some of you have probably seen the pink bags, um, where they come once a month maybe into town and they'll pick up your, you can put them out curbside. So we're looking at that as an option for textiles. The third item is the CRTs, the televisions. North Threading is one of the very few communities that you call, you put your TV out, they come and pick it up, and the town absorbs the cost of that. The other option that we're proposing here is that, as with the white goods, there would be a pass through, you call JRM, they'll pick up your TV, but they're going to bill you for that TV. So those are three additional, in addition to the, the pay as you throw, and I, I will say this, Joe has worked very hard. The town administrator's been involved, the finance director, the recycling committee, and they've worked very hard to come up with this recommendation of the pay as you throw. Obviously, this is kind of the, the baby step approach. The one, one barrel would be the next step. And a full pay as you throw program where you pay for every bag you throw out will be kind of the, the far end of the uh, equation going this way. Uh, I think if Joe were here, he would uh, get on board probably recommending this pay-as-you-throw because, like I said, he's coming from a community that had full pay-as-you-throw the, the bags. He's the one that's uh, spoken to the bag. How the bags work, and Dan was quite clear on this, it costs us to have the bags. It costs about 38 cents to manufacture and get a, a, a bag. They come in boxes of 200 in rolls of 10, and then it costs you charge for the, the poundage, whatever's in the bag, to try to recoup the, the cost of that tonnage that goes. So it takes a little bit off the tonnage equation. And the, the range is $2 to $2.50 a bag. So if we had a, a roll of 10 bags and you went down to the store and bought 25, you'd have you know, 10 bags. So you'd have 10 overthrow events covered through those bags. Um, I think that's about all I have right now. I do want to say this. Uh, I'm, Amy is with me here, so you guys talked about the complaint department. I mean, Amy is kind of <laughs> half of our complaint department right now, so she can probably speak to the, the issues better than I can. Um, I would be negligent if I didn't say this. Tuesday's trash is delayed till Wednesday this week. So the notice. I'm going to say that if we did. <laughs> so what you know what happened there? Last week Monday was a holiday, so the trash companies were already picking up a day late. Well, the people that they were going to pick up on Saturday. They didn't pick up on Friday, so the Friday people moved to Saturday, the Saturday people moved to Monday, and it just kicked us back. It's like, how did a storm on Friday affect us on Tuesday? It's because it just, there already was a holiday and they were already a day behind. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was, was aware of that, that the uh, trash is delayed. Can, can I ask a question? This one. So, you know, I'm thinking of my own, let's say I needed extra, and I had to do a bag like that. Uh, why wouldn't we just use a sticker so we avoid the whole manufacturing cost? I mean, I have my own bags already. I already have 30, I have a second 35 gallon barrel. I'm going to put three or four of my bags inside there, but now you're asking me to put those inside that bag in order to be, why wouldn't I just put a sticker on the top one and call so it? So the, the stickers was a problematic program. There were a number of issues with it. People would tear two stickers in half and put half on each bag and claim that they put <laughs> stickers on the bag. Hey, that's an bag. enforcement. That's an enforcement. People issue. would, we've had people print their own yeah. stickers. They bought round labels. Okay. Yeah. Close. They looked right, the a lot. They, they printed yeah. them in. Okay. There were, there were a number of problems with All the right. stickers. Counterfeit okay. stickers. Unbelievable, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, took, I didn't go that far south. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I got it. We have a few questions. Mrs. Sumner. <laughs> Can you unmute and you, I know you had your hand up raised. You haven't fallen asleep. You're on. No, I haven't. Thank you. Um, yeah, I live on a row with two duplex houses and I have problems with one barrel getting empty, let alone because there are two families in two houses. And you guys want to do it with one barrel. 
and go away and put one back. No. My trust was going to get picked up all the time. So I, I would just. Mr. Gill, I don't think we're doing away with two barrels. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Sumner, we're not doing away with two barrels. No, I know, but what I'm saying is some houses have, like, I live in a duplex, so that's two families. Yes, but they, they're only the treating it like you can only put two barrels between the two houses right. instead of four. Why would that right. be the case, Mr. No. Clark? So our standard practice is to bill a single family home $300 a year. If it's a two family home, it will be getting a double charge. And we actually have a few three family homes and we actually have two four family homes. So some people are getting quadruple trash bills. And that should be the case in your house if you're a duplex and classified as a duplex in our system, in which case you would be allowed four barrels. Right. But my one barrel isn't even getting picked up. And all the other stuff around my one barrel is. Call Amy. You, you can call the office. Yeah, call Amy. <laughs> 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 call Amy. I call. I do. If the trash is not collected, we do encourage residents to call us as soon as possible the next morning so that we can reach out to JRM. All right. I do. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sumner. Uh, Lena, are you still with us? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. I just had to unmute. Um, yeah, I just had a couple of comments and, and perhaps a question. Um, when we talk about the size of the barrel, every, every person that I know or when I drive around to West Reading, we all tend to have the same barrels. You roll the barrel down, and I think those are at least 45 gallons, if I'm not mistaken. It's the same size as my big blue recycle barrel, and I know that they both cost me around like $60. Um, what I see a lot of when I drive around or with my own trash and my family of four is that I don't use two barrels. I recycle a lot more my trash barrel. So what I mean by that is when we talk about, say, 20% of the people have two or more barrels, are we including the people that might just put a trash bag on top of that barrel? Because that's what I see a lot of. Technically, they only have one barrel, but, you know, going down from the two barrels, I, I, I can see reducing down to two barrels, but going from two barrels to one barrel, it's going to make a huge difference to people. And as far as the enforcement, what are we looking at for enforcement of that? Is it a ticket? Is it a fine? Is it, you know, there needs to be a little bit more solidification around that and clarity because that, I, I feel like there's more than 20% of people that are using more than quote unquote one barrel, especially if we're talking about a 35 gallon barrel. Um, that's my one piece of the pie. And the other thing that I had was talking about the elderly person who perhaps only uses a half, you know, half a bag of trash or a small bag of trash. What about on the flip side if we're talking about a family that perhaps has five people in it or six people in it? You know, it may be tough for them financially. And even if they're recycling like crazy, I recycle like crazy, and I still put out that barrel plus a little bit extra often, not every week, but I guess those are all the comments that I wanted to make. I'm sorry if I was a little bit uh, long-winded about it, but I guess, again, about the enforcement and about the barrel size and the extra trash bag, that's the thing I really want to know about. Okay. So for the size of the barrel, is it, yeah. do you have anything to... Mr. Clark, that you can, it's a 35 gallon barrel? So the, the way the trash regulations are currently written, it's two 35 gallon, up to two 35 gallon barrels per week. We do not have a standard barrel in North Reading, as everyone is aware that's ever driven around, that there are 
a variety of makes and models and sizes and colors and you know everything under the sun out there right now. So, and then the second. So question, can I just ask a question yeah, about that though? Sorry. So I guess the question is when we say the number of. Is okay to ask a question. I was just trying to get. I just about that point, yeah. just on the just point. Along. Just a quick question is, so when we're saying 70%, it's any barrel that went out that was one barrel? That would be Mr. Greenberg. I would defer to Mr. Greenberg on okay. the survey. So it's any barrel. Could be right. 90 gallons. Could be a big, huge I think barrel. that was her point. And that's, I think, but her point is that if you. Yeah. He's saying one barrel, but was that a 90? It yeah, could be two, really two barrels. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Yes. That's that question. Or it, it might should be two barrels and it's not. Right, it's right. Yet. So that seventy percent may be less if you were to say yeah, that the that's, standard is thirty-five. That okay. number to me, based on the tonnage, doesn't add up. So. Okay, thank you. But I'm not going to. I don't have any. I haven't done the surveying of the yeah. city of the town like the committee has. Mr. Greenberg has his hand up to respond. I think. Yes, but I do want before we. Mr. Greenman, give, give it a second because Lena also asked about how, how we're enforcing this. And it sounds to me like, we're, you know, we're, we're not ticketing this. We don't have a program to ticket someone because we're actually, we've been talking about this for so long now and picking up the extra, the extra that people put out there anyway. But I think for purposes of enforcing it, it would be once we make a decision moving forward, not only should we try to seek more uniformity in the trash barrels, but also uniformity with JRM, our hauler, and what they are supposed to be doing as well, right? So right now they're picking up everything, and now they're going to know it's two barrels in, in a bag, if that's what we're going to go to, right, Mr. Clark? So there obviously would be an education component to any changes to the trash program. When we did it back in 2014, and this was before you know a lot of the social media was out there, but we did mailings, we did uh, the best we could, posted what we could, a lot of articles in the transcript. Um, so typically what JRM would probably recommend is when you implement it, make a list of who's over, notify them of the change, you know, physically send them a letter saying, here's the changes, you were over this week. Then maybe a week or two after that, I know we don't like to talk about stickers, but put an orange <laughs> sticker on there, extra trash, and don't pick it up and say, we're not, we didn't pick this up because you put over the allowed limit out there and let them know that, you know, we're not doing it anymore. And, uh, you know, so it's a, a kind of a weaning into the, the process of doing it. Um, it does, it's one of the things that any changes you make to one of these programs, it does cause a lot of calls to not only us, you're going to, you guys will receive calls as well that people aren't happy about the change that's been made. So. Okay. Yes, uh, this is later again, but I guess my point is that if we're talking about the vast majority of barrels that I see out are the barrels that roll because a lot of people can't carry the trash. I think I am one of those people that can't. So the barrels that roll are typically 45 bigger minimum. barrels that we are thinking of, the 35 gallon barrels. So if we're talking about that, I guess again, that disparity, there seems to be a disparity with that 20% number because I'm typically only putting out one barrel, but my barrel is bigger than 35 gallons. It's not gigantic, it's the same size as my recycle barrel, my blue recycle barrel. But my question is, are we going to have? Oh, sorry. Are breaking up, Lena? We lost him. So that will be another issue. Just that is issue. people who have bought barrels, people that have brand new 45 gallon barrels, and now we're telling them, no, we're not picking that up again. And again, again that, that's the type of complaint we can expect to, to receive. Well, I can tell you, I have a 700 foot driveway, and that's not uncommon in this town. A lot of people have very long driveway. I don't, I, I can't throw the trash down a 700 foot drive. You know, I mean, that's why I have wheels on it to pull it down. So that is an issue. Do you, but you get a smaller barrel. She's, with wheels. I don't know. I, I'm, or, or 
I'm it. taking Lena's word on it. She said the, the 35s don't have them yet. So, okay. uh, again, maybe maybe the 35 isn't the answer. Maybe it's a 45. That should Correct. be the regulation. But I mean, th that right. could be revisited. Yeah. Make yeah. it a 45 yeah. gallon instead of yeah. a 35 gallon. Oh, I see. Maybe we change it to 45. Yeah. Okay. Ab Abigail? Abby? Um, hi. Um, yeah, I actually. I, initially, I wanted to say something about um, this business of quote more environmentally friendly disposal of uh, trash or whatever you want to call it, solid waste. I, I understand that the concept is if you if you go down in in the amount of trash you have, then maybe you can the recycling the stuff you're not putting in the trash cycle. I'm not convinced. That that really is going to work. I don't think. I think there are some people that recycle and stand up, but there are other people that still care less. So I would prefer to see some of <laughs> only trash plan that works to increase the recycling. Yeah, and I think we know from discussion of this the past couple of years that that. That increase in recycling didn't necessarily yield any kind of Safeness. surplus. It was the exact opposite because they stopped. Yeah. That caused the, caused us to have to increase because it caused the cost of hauling to be higher um, due to all the issues associated with it. Thirty-five. Um, so okay. So what are we? What's the action plan for tonight? Are you? With D Mr. Greenberg and the committee has put forward a program that they're looking for us to possibly take a vote on. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of dialogue here that perhaps we should, um, you know, consider like what the what uh, Lena mentioned. Maybe the program should allow the 245 gallon barrels and then over that. You know, but that's not what's being proposed. It's always been 35, but people are still putting out the 45 anyway, so go ahead. We, so we have to do something about that. The, the purpose of this evening right. was to put this issue out there, and you see there's two very important components that don't get a lot of discussion. First, there are a lot of people with barrels larger than 35 gallons that we need to be considering in the discussion. And second, JRM will do pretty much what we instruct them to do, but we've been hesitant to do that because of the impact we know it will have given the volume of people who are putting out additional volume beyond the two barrels. So we wanted to put this out there. I, I think the thing that we need to look at going back from a program standpoint is what's the right barrel size and what impact does that have for the community. There will be an impact. Somebody will be impacted because their barrel is either too small or too big. I think the key is figuring out what size barrel do most people have and trying to the extent we can work around that. Some communities have opted to do the um, the purchase of barrels for the community and issuing those barrels. There's a cost associated with that and I think our goal is to try to keep the cost down to the extent that we can. So we'll take this feedback and we'll talk with the recycling committee and with the DPW um, and the DPW director about how we might fine tune this more. There will be a further conversation about the trash budget on Saturday at the DPW budget hearing and ultimately there'll be a discussion with regard to the fee later in the spring. But we really wanted to highlight the issues that we're looking at, including, and I know it was brought up at the end, the significant change in the, the DEP regulations regarding the textile items. That's an impact that we need to be considering. Unfortunately, there are options that we're working on. So really, we were just looking for some feedback at this point. The other thing, Madam Chair, through you, uh, Mr. Greenberg re referenced a memorandum that was written by the, DP, uh, the Recycling Committee. It was inadvertently not put in the meeting packet. I have since added it there. It's a separate document in PDF that's two pages long, written by uh, Mr. Greenberg and the chair of the committee, detailing most of what he has described in terms of the rationale here. Um, so I apologize to, to Dan and the board for that oversight, but I have added it to the share file meeting folder for this evening. Okay. Mr. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Why can't we go with the two barrels? And, you know, whatever size barrel people have, they have right now anyway. You know, and then we can work on the 45 or 60 or 35, whatever it's going to be. But go to the pay as you throw for the additional, additional barrels. You know, so let, let's take the step forward here rather than referring it back to committee. And, uh, you know, 
we can work through the barrel issue, but two is two, you know, right. two. You know, anything more than two, you need a bag. Can someone show me, and you show me what's the difference between 35 and 45, I mean, just by height? So if you think about 35, and I'm probably showing my age here, it's the old standard aluminum with the yeah. aluminum Oscar lid. Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> exactly. The Thank you. Yeah. I don't see those anywhere around. They're, they're, very difficult. they're not really, now everything is plastic. And Mary Pretty and Brad moved out of town. That's what they had. <laughs> <laughs> so now they're they're plastic, plastic. Most of them have wheels so that they're easier to yeah. roll around and they're mostly larger than a 35 gallon. But the larger ones would be 45 and 96. So there's there's 45, there's 64, and there's 96. I live in Haverhill, and they give us a 96-gallon trash bin. And you're allowed to do one? We're allowed to do one, and they have overflow bags. I just feel like that's a lot for them to pick up. So those are meant to be picked up with the mechanical. With the with the mechanical. Yeah. But, but for now, let's that's embrace what's being yeah. proposed here. Mm -hmm. Enforcing so. the two-barrel limit with the overflow well, we're not making a decision tonight, though, anyway. No, but this was just discussion. Can I just not, but also, just one thing to consider about that. Mm -hmm. You know what I do tomorrow if you do this, and I'm using a lot? Online, sale right now. $75 for a 96-gallon. I'll have two of those. There's a workaround. I'm so saying that there's an obvious way. workaround to the... Uh, that's what I'm saying. I'm not against any of this. I don't want anybody to think that. I'm just saying that... We're going to enact a policy that there's already a workaround. It took me five and a half seconds to figure this out when it was when I read this earlier today while I was having my coffee. Like that's the workaround. I just went online and until and then Amazon will have Amazon Day and I'll get it for fifty dollars. So now I will have two ninety-six gallon, right? Because I can have my two barrels. But at some point, that ninety-six is not going to be allowed, or it's only yeah, but, but, but I'm saying right because that's too much. Right. But your As pay to throw will not deter it. So I'm saying I kind of agree with Mr. Walner that if you really want to have an impact, I don't think the bags will. I think you just got to go down to one and then define what one is. More likely than not, I don't see a way around. I feel like communities where it's worked, the town or city ponies up or subsidizes the barrel, right, and says this is everyone's going to get. Please come down to the DPW. Here's a lollipop while you're at it. Like that's... I just don't see a way around it. Okay, so we should, we should, we do, we do have, we should, we should move on. Can I just make one? You can make, yes, you, you can make one comment, and, but I will say I totally agree with Mr. O'Leary. What are we waiting on? Let's just make a decision on this. I, I just, I just want to give Gonzalez. kudos to Mr. Greenberg because mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody here understands the commitment and the time and effort he has put into this. He has literally made an appointment with JRM, gone there to see the trash truck empty out how much tonnage was there. I mean, he's gone to that extent to do that. It's, it's something he's really put his heart in and I don't want anybody to take that lightly. Yes, we know that, Mr. Greenberg. We know all the no, work that you're Which is why I want to embrace it and start moving forward. Exactly. Even if it's incremental I mean, steps. This isn't something that's just on a whim being brought up no. to us right now. Right. This is something that, when I mean, we've talked about this, I don't know how many years, it's kind of like the snow ordinance. We just keep talking about it, but we know we need to take steps to address it. And I think we should say tonight, too, is it 35 or 45? It's definitely not 96. Not 96, but not 35. It's two, and it's 45. So That's I say 45. I say. If, if we're if we, in between, we hear this as an issue. That's 245. And if all there's all these varieties of sizes anyway, then and none of the Oscars. There's actually size, a lot. Then a lot. we're already paying for it with the fee that's being collected. So we should just define that now yeah. too. And Mr. Gilberto, I want you to just check and make sure none of those questions in the chat are anything relevant to this. Uh, so there was a, a question relative to the overflow bags being able to be put into barrels to prevent them from being torn open by animals. Mr. Greenberg answered, yes, overflow bags may be uh, put in the barrel. There was also a question about uh, the oversized items like couches or mattress, which is, I think Mr. Clark spoke to. 
Um, and then there was also a question about, I was, a, was a Miss Simone saying, I uh, apologize for her phone going out, the concerns is the barrel size. Okay, I mean, really, we know that they're not 35 or 25 or something like that. And we know that a whole purpose of an overflow is because you fill the barrel, so it doesn't make sense to put it inside the barrel because it's not gonna fit in the barrel, so. All right, Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, through you. Uh, to Mr. Greenberg, Mr. Mr. Greenberg, there is a standard that DEP looks for uh, for its grant program. Can you just remind us what that that barrel size is for that standard? Thirty-five. It's thirty-five gallons. Um, there are it, it, you can buy in the marketplace real thirty-five gallon barrels. Yeah, um, in order to be eligible for the DEP page and program grant, it has to be a thirty-five oh, gallon okay. barrel. Um, and, and, and I just want to respond to something that Mrs. Earlborn said. Um, the fact of the matter is that the 155 communities in Massachusetts that have adopted the ASU throw have on the average experienced a 30% reduction in tonnage of solid waste trash. It works. Okay. Let's... Um Let's just keep the comments directed through the chair, please. And Mr. Greenberg, thank you for the input. Is there anything else you have, Mr. Clark, on the on point? Anything else you want to add, Mr. Clark? Uh, no, I'll say uh, <laughs> we'll be here on uh, Saturday morning. So if you guys have so more we'll questions, uh, <laughs> you can take it up then. All right, All right. Mr. Gilbert, anything else in the chat, or are we good with that? Uh, no additional comments. No. Okay, so what's the board's pleasure here? About what? Mr. O'Leary wants us to do something. Make it, make a move. Well, if you're gonna, I, 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 I'm not opposed to the no two problem. gallon, but what he just pointed out is correct. If you don't also say what the barrel size is, people are gonna go out and get the extra size barrel so they fit underneath. So before everybody buys a bunch of them, and then we come back later and say. Now it's not, that's the wrong size barrel. You, you should tell them right ahead, we're doing the stickers, and soon it will be 35-gallon barrels. There's no more stickers. Well, there's stickers, no the bags, sorry, the bags. There's no vote. No, it's, but it's not intended no on a vote to be tonight. We, I think we need to go back and fine-tune a little bit, and then come back. Great. Just, I just want to... Mr. Greenberg, is there anything that you think that we can implement? No, tonight. Is there anything that you think we can implement, or, or what is, based upon what you've heard this evening, what would you suggest we do? How much more fine tuning is there going to do to this? It's I think you should vote tonight to go to two 35-gallon barrels in the overflow bags. That's what I think you should do. It's already at 35, so we don't need to vote on that. It's already the appropriate requirement. That no, yeah. it's not being complying with. Yeah, it's, it's not, not being, enforced, being enforced. To be yeah. clear, yeah. it's the enforcement. Yeah, it's the enforcement. Thing. The enforcement that we, the ability to enforce, would be you tell JRM it's this is it. And that's, don't pick that's it. that. Yeah, and that's where the sticker comes in, the big orange sticker that says. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I understand. Out. Sorry, but we are in all that's not gonna, that's unrealistic. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Although I have to say, when we moved in in 2002 and this changed in 2008, we got a bright orange sticker. Oh yeah, I got So uh, it, it was enforced in some places, mm -hmm. namely <laughs> our house. And we made it too bad. But that's when it was the stickers, right? But it, let's. Let's move on from there, and I think we should really be realistic about it. We know people are, and when we even had someone sitting in waiting to talk on this for about 20 minutes, we know the barrel size isn't 35. So, Mr. Clark, what do you recommend? Can we? I'd like to hear his recommendation because he's he seems to know more about. Yeah, but also Mr. Parisi's not here, and I feel like oh, he should have. I yeah, mean, well, he's been that very involved part parents. of this work. With yeah. So I will say, if you look at the graph of the tonnage versus the number of barrels, when we reduced from four barrels to three barrels to two barrels, the tonnage that was put out as solid waste did go down over those years. 
from 2014 to now, it fluctuates a little from year to year, but we haven't made any any change, major changes since then. So the tonnage has literally stayed level over those last eight years. If we're looking to drive down the tonnage, I think we need to do something patient throw wise. This is the first step in that. We can't guarantee what the numbers are going to be, but it's the first step towards doing that. It does raise, as every one of you have pointed out, it raises a number of issues as to how do we get from where we are to where we anticipate being. If it's going to be 35 gallon barrels and it's going to be two of them and anything over that's overflow, that's going to create a lot of uh, transition for people. If you have two 45 gallon barrels and now we're telling you we're not picking those up anymore, that's going to be a, what are you doing with those too? So that's another, you know, do those become solid waste, your old trash <laughs> barrels? You know, the, the trash for had, the trash. Had, had plastic collection in June. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's what it is. That's what DPW oh, saying. If we do math, right? I mean, Mr. Greenberg saying we, in order to be um, with the DEP for the grant, we have to have two thirty-fives. Can we have one? Can we just have one barrel that equals 235? I, so I mean, you're doing the same math, it's still the same tonnage. <laughs> I don't understand why we're talking about like a DEP grant for phase. Oh, how much oh, is this grant? Oh, collecting a fee from our, everybody here is paying a fee. You know, that resides here is paying a fee for trash. Because there's a grant program that he's working oh, with. For what, though? How much is it? What, what would that be for, by a barrel or? One year's worth of grant funding, or I mean, we have to think a long term, like to long term sustain sustainability, not relying upon grants to supplement our program for which we're charging residents a fee for collection. So, you know, being realistic, what are we even looking at? What do we? What would we use a phase with our grant for? All right, well, let's see if it's worthwhile, Mr. Greenberg. Yeah. Um if you go to the one thirty-five gallon barrel of the overflow bed, the DEP grant would be a hundred dollars per household, somewhere just south of forty-five thousand dollars, and that could be used to purchase thirty-five to subsidize the purchase of thirty-five gallon barrels for those people that are using larger barrels. How many times, We're Mr. Greenberg? We're already at thirty-five gallon, and we've never had that grant, so I don't even understand why that's even thrown in the mix here. Is the grant once? Because you can't, in order to get the grant, you have to go to one barrel of 35 gallons and a pay as you throw over full bag. I thought it was two. That, those are the criteria for Is eligibility for the grant. Is it a one time grant? Is it a one time grant, Mr. Greenberg? Yes, it is. It's 0.0007% uh -huh. of the North Reading budget. Well, that's not helpful. All right. Okay. I'm Let's just saying everything's relative, Rich. You're a numbers guy. <laughs> Okay, so the proposed changes are... It's not all about the money, too. It's about the environment. It's about doing the right thing. It's getting people to do things they don't want to do. But if we can go without that grant money no, I'm, I'm and go to the 45 and make people a little more happy... I'm not disagreeing. I don't think people are going to be happy about the 35. I think we're going to get a lot, a lot back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Poor Amy's phone is going to be right up. <laughs> You're going to be picking up a lot of barrels. And I mean... It so it already is 35. And so in order for us to get a grant, one time grant, we'd have to go eliminate one? Yeah. Okay. We're, we're veering off course here. I'm just going to say it. We're, we were on course with <laughs> proposed changes, and now we're veering way off course. So let's just stick to the course of what we were talking about was proposed changes involving, you know, sticking to the two barrels and a bag. That's what we were talking about. Now we're, we're you know, we're talking about one-time grant funding that we don't need because we charge a fee. In my opinion, we don't need it. So are we going to make a resolve, take a stand, make a vote, wait, look at this more, study it a little bit more? Go around and figure out what size barrels people are looking yeah. at. Give people the opportunity to put two 45 gallons, one big 96 gallon, 
for 35 gallon. What are we doing? Here? That's maybe, a lot of like maybe we selection. Maybe we can talk trash another night. <laughs> Who's our liaison? Is it you? Yes. What do you think? <laughs> I think 35 gallon. Or do you want to take a committee and come back? I, I would, yeah. I would like to. I think there's a meeting tomorrow night. Mr. Greenberg isn't there? The yes. I'll, I'll just say from my, I'll, I can pull the I have it as tomorrow night, am I wrong? <laughs> Lee, Mrs. Gonzalez, I can pull the membership on this, but I'll just All right. say from the chair that if we don't fix it to 45 gallon yeah. to an overflow, I, you're not gonna have my support on it. Correct. You know people aren't grown. We already know they're not putting out 35. Right. Leanne, that's your opinion. That's my that. opinion also. I'm all for it. I think that the overflow bag is a great idea. Um, I, I, but I don't see 35 gallons. I know that's what we have now, but I don't, I don't see people. If we're gonna start enforcing that, I, I see that as a problem. I think 45 is reasonable. Mr. Mr. Um, I agree with both of you. <clears throat> I can summarize my issue with this, as you probably heard me say now multiple times. From the start, that 70% using one or fewer, 35 gallon, I didn't believe it. And the way I do everything, I'm a numbers guy. If the base, if the basis of the conversation, if the data to me is inaccurate, then I can't really have a reasonable conversation around it. So. If we can get real data on how many of these fewer barrels are actually 45 or 55 or 65, then, then we can readdress it. But until I have that real data, I mean, you're not going to sell me that 70% of people in North Reading are using one ba uh, barrel of 35 gallons. All right. And so, Mr. Studer, you're in favor of status quo without I'm, But I just wanted on the record that I'm in favor of status quo because I don't think these are accurate numbers. All right. And I'm not going to make a decision on bad numbers. On status quo is 35-gallon, two 35-gallon bags. Mr. Waller. So I think it should go back to committee. I, I agree with him. It's like we have bad data. I think that 70% is questionable. I think you should go back and look at that. And I think it doesn't have to take a long time to do that. I think that can no, right. resolve very quickly. And, um, and I think that if you're going to step, if you're going to have, at least for the purposes of our analysis, if your ultimate goal is to be here, then let's chart it out and look at it. And, you know, and that should be something that's advertised in the entire town so they know at this date we're going here, yes. and this date we're going here, and this grandfather end, yes. right? Let's not make it a no, shock. Barrels don't last forever. They last three, four years, and then you're replacing them, right? So let's let's build in the standard we're looking for. And let's do a you know a three, four year conversion rate, and whatever you can do now. But at least you're telling people ahead of time we're going to do that extra bag now. Um, but don't go buy a 95 gallon one because in three, four years it's not going to be it's not going to be allowed anymore. Those right? are big. So I think you should bring it back to committee. You've heard some good input. I think yeah. there's been good information brought in. Enforcement right. being one of the big ones. Um, and then, you know, try to come up with a long-term plan. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Then I, then I, I would be supporting that. Mr. O'Leary. I'm okay with phasing it in, you know, but two barrels is two barrels. And don't go buy a 95-gallon barrel because, again, that's not going to be the standard. And, and again, <laughs> whether it's 45 or 35, again, I think the 45 is probably more realistic to what most people have or would get. So to me, it's you know, the 245s, grandfather, grandfather people in until we have a, a drop dead date as you phase it in. But it's two barrels now, and the bags are available. You know, to me, I, I think we need to start somewhere. You know, and we need to uh, to start moving forward. And again, I have concerns that the that the bags are going to get, you know, the animals are going to get in the bags. But uh, if there's a solution to that, I'm all ears. Why? So you can put the bags into a barrel. Well, okay, if that's the case, then that's fine. But that uh, barrel doesn't count. No, I don't. Just so long as it's one of those just, so it's just one of those green bags in there. But again, so I'm in favor of the two-barrel enforcement. Have the pays to throw, whether anything additional, and you know, grandfather and phase in the, the the barrels. Work on the barrel size again. As far as the grant money, the forty-five thousand dollar grant money, 
I, I'm not overly concerned about losing out on an opportunity to get a $45,000 grant. I'm more concerned with getting some compliance with it, which brings about some equity and some fairness. It also encourages people to recycle and uh, take on the environmental issues at the same time. So, I don't know if that answers your question. I think I'm hearing at least the majority want the two barrel 45 and page and girl. And I think I'm hearing that. And I do think, you know, I guess our colleagues want to have a little bit more. The only, the only concern I have about that is you mentioned that your ultimate goal is to go to one barrel. But, and if you go up to 45, if you're trying to control tonnage, you just went the wrong way. So now you, have a, you went from 35 to 45 times two barrels. If ultimately the goal is to end up at 145, then that makes sense. But, the, but otherwise, it doesn't. I mean, if you're trying to bring tonnage down, you're not, you're not going that way. Right. But, but I think already put out the 45. I think what we've decided is that it, it had, it, but there's no. I, I understand. But what I'm saying is, if it's, it's in four of, years you're saying it's going to be 145, then you're telling people when you give them three, four years heads up, then you're on the right path. You know, then, yeah. then it makes sense. But if you're never going to go to that one barrel 45, if that's not your ultimate goal, then we haven't we haven't solved our tonnage problem. So at some point, I'm saying, go to the 45. I'm okay with that, but. It should be at the end, the very last phase is, and we're going down to 145 gallons, so we get the tonnage down. And that, then that makes sense. Well, let's see what the number, what happens with the numbers yeah. when we go to the 245. Because we're not trying to treat, increase capacity or something, so we're trying, to, we're trying to at least keep it where it is and enforce what we have, right? By the way, I have a question, Mr. Clark. Oh, that's just good you mentioned that the tonnage went down, right, over the years, and then it stayed level since the last. Is it because more people started recycling? I'm assuming it's not because people started, like, were just eating less. So the, I don't believe the tonnage of recycling increased a whole lot. The, it, it's an odd, and I... I mean, I mean decrease. No, you would think if you decrease the tonnage of solid waste, the recycling tonnage would go up, because it's one or the it's, it, it's a combination of the two. Okay. If you force people to recycle more, you could drive down your trash tonnage. So the two kind of uh, work together. So our recycling percentage rate has been about 21%, 22%, and this goes back to 2009. Our recycling tonnage has been 1,300 tons per year. If you go back to 2009, we were at 5,200 tons of trash. That dropped by 2014, it dropped to 4,300. So it dropped from 5,200 to 4,300 tons a year. And then it's kind of been 43, 41, 42, 44, 45 ever since then. So the, the trash tonnage went down from 2009 to 2014 fairly significantly. The recycling tonnage has been about the same. And, and the reason I also say that, uh, another point, because um, I guess there's, you know, 150 communities have done it, but another breakdown, I'm not trying to create more work, but another thing I noticed, and why in Malden this thing is working, they don't have septic in Malden. Garbage disposal, food waste, yeah. that's something. It's a, it, but to me, it seems a lot. I mean, maybe we cook five, six times a week, and I can tell you that I, we use, with the same, same things, we use double, double the trash we used to when I lived in Malden, and that's because I don't have a disposal to take care of a lot, a lot. So are, I, not to throw it in another factor into the equation here, but DEP is also pushing organics type recycling, where you take that and have a separate disposal for your food waste Compost. that goes somewhere else so take that out of your your solid waste tonnage but again it's introducing another now you've got to separate out your food scraps so they go somewhere else we're not talking we haven't talked about that at all tonight. oh that would be real <laughs> popular oh, Mr. well there's companies that come and pick that up yeah they honey, are. Honey, honey bucket yeah yeah, we have two barrels in the house, like a barrel for everything, a barrel for a car, and a barrel yes. for food. Okay, so so we're just one yeah. trash it's barrel. It's being a conscientious dispo disposer and less waste. I'm just less, saying, there's 14,000 and change people that need to kind of like this. All right, Mr. Um, Mr. Greenberg, let's give you the last word on this. Um, 
organics are 30 percent of the solid waste stream. Um, my next project after this one is composting. We can reduce, if, if everybody in town composted their organics, we would immediately see a 30 percent reduction in tonnage. Or get a dog. Let's hear that. There's a lot of weight in there's a lot of weight in melons, you know. You throw them in the, there's a lot of weight. It's water. It's water. It's water weight. It's water. It's actually interesting. All right, folks. All right. Okay, so we are moving on. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Greenberg. We're moving on, but what have we decided? Nothing? Zero. <laughs> I think I'm, I, I suggest I'm go back to committee. I think yes. go back to committee. We're going to discuss. And I, and I suggest set up a four or five year plan. Thing. You know, and I think that's a good. I think that that can solve a lot Don't of problems. Don't wait on the compost, though. I think we should hear. I about compost that now. should happen right away. Yeah, there is a lot of that's weight. A great idea. A lot of people already do that. There's a company that comes into town, and there's a lot of people that already do in their backyard. They have their own composting. They do. They do. I think. I'm, I'm just sitting here. You put it in your garden. It's a uh -huh. fun thing. Grow tomatoes to make your sauce. <laughs> we should have a public right. hearing. Okay. On the we, should, we need to. We need to. We need to move on. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Mr. It's good. It's a good discussion, right. actually. Okay. So we're gonna hear. Here's more about that. Stay tuned. Next. Oh. All right, we are on to the next order of business, which is a review of the revenue. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all, this, all this doom and gloom. <laughs> she said, oh, we should have talked about that before the trash talk. <laughs> Madam, uh, oh, Madam Chair, 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 Madam Madam Chair, through you, um, as I uh, expressed to some of the members before the meeting, um, we are not uh, intending to go through a detailed review of the revenue plan uh, this evening. Um, we were not planning that uh, even before um, the hour got somewhat late. What we wanted to do, though, is to call to the attention of the board members that we are working with the financial planning team on the revenue plan. You know, some of the things that we are looking at is where there might be opportunities to uh, make adjustments to our forecasts for local receipts um, and potentially ultimately uh, reduce our reliance on a significant transfer from the debt capital state uh, debt service stabilization fund that we make each year now into the budget um, looking to sort of balance rather than making that transfer trying to more um, accurately reflect um, what what our revenues are and the way that transfer actually works is we end up generating a bunch of free cash and then using it from the pre previous year to fund the, the following year's budget. And so we're looking to see how we might get away from that. There aren't any decisions that have been made with regard to that, um, and it, it's very likely that anything we do do would be phased. Um, but we did want to call that to your attention, and there is some active work going on with the financial planning team. The other thing we just wanted to make the uh, board members aware of you know, in our conversations is that uh, you know we've been you know looking at our fixed cost projections and um, you know one of them is our health insurance. Um, it's not up in the updated cost reflection here for um, the financial planning team because uh, we received the information after this edition of the plan of the financial of the revenue plan was put together. But um, we have received a substantial you know increase in the quote um, that we are reviewing with the financial planning team and with the insurance advisory committee as well. So. You know, it's a larger number than we've seen in, in prior years. Um, you know, well, we believe we are well positioned because of our participating funding arrangement um, with uh, the health insurance plan. Um, something we need to be cognizant of. Um, I think you can expect to see a more detailed presentation of the revenue plan um, either on March 14th or March 28th uh, at the budget hearings um, after we meet with the rev with the financial planning team. Um, but I, I kind of want to just give folk, folk, I want to point folks to that document that is in the meeting packet and let you know that there's a lot of active work going on, as there always is this time of year. And to you, Madam Chair, I don't know if there's anything the finance director has to add to it, but just wanted to sort of put that on everyone's radar. Right. Ms. Roth, anything else? Just that we continue to work on the revenue plan. We have another financial planning meeting on Monday morning um, with 
hopefully further updates to the revenue plan and hopefully to have the total school, total municipal budget so we can see where we stand and um, what our budget shortfall will be. Shortfall? That's why I said it very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> shortfall? I, I wish I could say that, you know, we go into this, you know, we came out without a shortfall, but we always end up with a balanced budget. It just takes us some time to get there. So. And we work as a team. Thanks, Lisa. Health insurance is always a significant driver of a shortfall versus a windfall. So. Yes. Yes. Okay, any questions? Oh. All set? All right. Thank you. Excellent. I'm glad you stuck around for that. <laughs> uh, you would have missed all the fun. I, I've well. been deeply involved in trash um, and attended every meeting and was involved, you know, last year when we had the, the trash meeting. So it's um, appropriate for the finance director numbers. Yes, I I, uh, I feel that it was important for me to be there. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank okay. You. We'll uh, move on to our next order of business, which is to vote to place the unexpired three-year term for the Housing Authority on the ballot of the May 3rd, 2022 regular election. This was the seat that was Mary Prince and she vacated in her retirement. Correct. So we have motion. Madam Chair, I move to place an unexpired three year term for Housing Authority on the ballot for the May 3rd, 2022 annual election. Set term to expire at the 2025 annual town election. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Mr. O'Leary. They were already offering nomination. Someone already took out nomination papers for this term, right? Yeah. Yes, I believe so. Okay, so. One or more than one? No, I mean, we, so we, I didn't realize we had the vote to put it on. It's called the vote. No, I, I, was, uh, you know, I wasn't sure we, why would we have to vote to put it on there and the papers were already available. <laughs> but, <laughs> Madam Chair, through you, that he, Mr. Earlier is correct. We're ratifying an action that town clerk foresaw would, would, would be taking place. Um, it, it is a vacancy that's out there. Even if a joint appointment had been made, which was not sought by the Housing Authority, it would have only been through May of 2022, 20, this May. Um, we have not necessarily brought this type of a, a vote to the select board when it's come up in the past. The two times I can think of, one, the, con the Community Planning Commission two or three years ago, and another, the school committee, I think seven years ago at this point, come to mind. Uh, but you are correct. You're, we're ratifying a, an action of opening up uh, the, the solicitation of um, papers for those who wish to run for the position. Well, go for it. <laughs> well the, um, the term is what? It's a three-year term. Commencing May 3rd or May 22nd? May 3rd of 2022 okay. through May of 2025. All right. Once elected. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, we're, we're doing this before the election, so. It needs to be 15 days before the nomination papers <laughs> are due. All right. <laughs> <laughs> right okay. there, yes. <laughs> Well, then, no, it's important when we discuss this to know if you want to run. Is it when, did, when is the nominee, when is the nominee paper due back? Two weeks from tonight, from, from today, I believe. So if someone's out there is interested in running to be elected to the Housing Authority, then pull your papers. There's also a five year term. There's That's actually right. two. Yeah, there's, there's actually a five year term also. This is, this is Maude. A regular five year term. This is Maude, whose the five year term is up, is running for the three year term. Correct. So that term is also available. So there's a three-year term in the Housing Authority and a five-year term. How much should they pay them? But twice as much as you. Twice as much as you get. <laughs> Nothing. A big round. <laughs> it's very rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone always asks that. How much should we pay? A lot. Oh, I like it when someone tells me that they pay my salary. You know, when, they're up, when they're upset with me. I pay your salary. I said, I'll, give it back, I'll give it back to you. We're paying appreciation. <laughs> True. All right, so we have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? I think we had it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Next um, item on the agenda is the appointment for the Commission on Disabilities, Historic District Commission, and Taxation Aid Committees, which Mr. Waller, you're the liaison on all of those, right? Yes, I am. All right. So we'll hear the motion and then we'll hear from you. Madam Chair, I move to place a nomination of the following names for appointment to the Historic District Commission for terms to expire on December 31st, 2024. There are two openings. Heather T. Server, Severs, Andrew Parson, Matthew Page. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. And we'll hear from you, Mr. Walner. Yeah, can someone just point me to what page it is on our select page? 17. 17. 17. 17, thank you. Where the motion is, correct? That's where the motion is. 17, thank you. I think that things got changed. All right, yes, um, so uh, the chair, Mark Hall, um, has had good interest in his group, I think largely because of you know, the work they did last year with that development, uh, the Wheeler property, which we still haven't seen take off, but they've had a lot of people involved with that, so there's been good interest in continuing to do those, those kind of good things. And so um, uh, the, the recommendation is we have two openings, is Heather uh, Sivers and Andrew Parson are the two recommendations. And the chair and I are agreed in agreement on those recommendations. Okay. Any further discussion? This is a roll call name vote for the appointments. And again, Mr. Walner and the chair are recommending Heather Severs and Andrew Parson for the two available seats. Mr. Uh oh, Mr. Mr. Uh oh. <laughs> Dr. Somebody, Doom here. <laughs> somebody, somebody withdrew there. Uh, no, uh, but we had a spelling error in the motion. It's Andrew Pearson rather than oh. Andrew Parson. Oh, Pearson? Pearson. Thank you. Does the chair know that? No, you, only because I just told you. You didn't know that before. <laughs> no, I mean the chair, the historic commission, if he's recommended yes. Parson. Yes. Yeah. yes, but yes. his appointment paperwork thing that I signed is correct. Thanks to Mrs. McNeil. <laughs> okay. Name, roll call name vote. Mr. O'Leary. Heather Severs, Andrew Pearson. Mr. Walmer. Heather Severs, Andrew Pearson. Mr. Studo. Heather Severs, Andrew Pearson. Mrs. Gonzalez. Heather Severs, Andrew Pearson. And Nathan Kelly is Heather Severs and Andrew Pearson. All right. Madam Chair, I move to place a nomination of the following names for the appointment of the Commission on Disabilities for terms to expire as follows, five openings. Nikki Tosi, Gina Moran, Rebecca Griffin, Marissa Morello, Richard Walker. They, they have different terms, though. So oh, terms. sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll repeat that. Nikki Tosi, uh, through December 31st, 2024, Gina Moran. Moran through December 31st, 2024. Rebecca Griffin through December 31st, 2023. Marissa Morello through December 31st, 2023. Virtual Wong through May 31st, 2022. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. And these are all, I don't know if you need to comment, but these are all for appointment to open, open seats. Yeah, the, the entire committee from before has disbanded, so this is a complete reward. We're doing it over again. Uh, um, if you've ever seen Huskies in front of a sled, how anxious they are to get going, and the enthusiasm. I met with all these people. They are, they are they're knowledgeable. They have experience within their own families, within their own households, with the, the topics we're talking about, and they have many, many ideas about how we can make an impact on our community. Um, and so I, I embrace all of them. I'm delighted that in one setting, we were able to find the five people we need to get this done. So I'll be okay. hanging on for dear life, trying to keep up with them. Great. Strongly okay. recommend all of them. Yeah. So Mr. Studo's motion, which is seconded by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Nikki Tossi, Gina Moran, Rebecca Griffin, Marisa Morello, and Richard Walner. Mr. Walner. Nikki Tosi, Gina Moran, Rebecca Griffin, Marisa Morello, Richard Walner. Mr. Studo. Nikki Tosi. Gina Moran, Rebecca Griffin, Marissa Morello, Richard Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez. Nikki Tosi, Gina Moran, Rebecca Griffin, Marissa Morello, Richard Walner. And Mimi Kelly is Nikki Tosi, Gina Moran, Rebecca Griffin, Marissa Morello, and Richard Walner. 
Landslide Walnut. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to place the nomination of the following name for appointment to the Taxation Aid Committee for a term to expire as follows. Two openings. John Varenja through December 31st, 2024. Second. Good. So, again, that's, uh, so Deb Carbone's on it, Mary Ann McKay's on it. They're, they're required by statute to be on it. Um, I'm on it because I'm the liaison. It looks like I might end up being the chair. Um, the, uh, we still have an opening because Mary Prenny was on it, but until that position, so we have to hold that spot open. So that's uh, until we have that new person, they'll, they'll come to that spot. And then John Barang Barangia here, he's had, he's had like 17 years of experience doing exactly the thing we want to do. And our, our tax, again, this is like a do-over, our taxation aid committee has to be entirely looked at again for relevance and everything else. And some of the points I brought up, out about how we haven't anybody come to us in like seven, eight years only points to the fact that our parameters are not relevant to our community. And he recognized it immediately. So I'm really delighted he's on board because he understands it much better than I do. Um, so strong recommendation again, he's happy to work with us. He's a CPA, he's been in Revere for 17 years. He's very experienced and delighted to have him on board. Okay. Motion by Mr. Studo, Seconded by Mr. O'Leary? Yes, yes. All right. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, John Varangia. Mr. Walner. John Varangia. Mr. Studo. John Varangia. Mrs. Gonzalez. John Varangia. And me, Ellen. John Varangia. We only voted this in a while, though. Where? That's it. I mean, I got no other motions for these. No. Next order, business is town administrator. No. no report this evening. No report this evening. Wow. We talked, we, we talked about everything we need to say. Okay. Next, the order of business, our board member reports, and we might as well lump that with all the new business. And Mr. O'Leary. I hope I set the stage. I'm all set. Wow. <laughs> Um, uh, the only thing I'll make everybody aware of is that Phil Hertz from the Land Utilization Committee has done a fantastic job of bringing us to the, is ready to bring us to the next level about um, looking for funding for the town so that we can um, get mass DOT um, potentially eight to nine million dollars worth of funding, but we have to go, we have to approve some planning uh, funding to get that to happen. He's working on grants. I have the layout in front of me. The, the maps look good. We have real possibilities of making this rail trail all come together. So it's um, really exciting, really yeah, exciting opportunity exciting. for us. And um, as soon as you can get in front of us, I think you know we'll, we should be the first view of seeing what's going on to get your input. But um, this has a strong possibility of going through, and it would really open up a major amenity for our town that we don't have now. Absolutely. So. Um, I remember the last time he was here, we were really all on board with doing whatever he could to bring it, you know, to bring it to fruition. It sounds to me like you are, is it, are there going to be, just like what you do with the age friendly, because uh, of the length of presentation, it sounds to me like, would there be a meeting that you would have publicly like you do with age friendly to kind of roll out the explanation of that? Yeah, yeah, we'd be, uh, he'd be delighted to do that. I say yeah. we, he'd be delighted to do that um, yeah. in any yeah. form. And we were gonna go to- be, It might be you, it might end up being you. I'd be see. happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily he gave me simple slides because his slides are much more uh, yeah. involved. But um, yeah, we'd want to go, we would definitely want to go to different like land utilization committee, parks and rec. We want to go to the finance committee because there's money involved. Yeah. We definitely want to come here because there's yeah. some, you know, issues we have to deal with um, that, you know, would be impactful to the town, some, some residents, um, and then to, out to the community, because people should really be aware of how we would connect with Willis Woods, how we would connect with all the trails that would open up for us, um, a big thing. And one of the big features, um, I'll just give you a little hint about this, it's gonna involve three bridges. One of the bridges would bring us from the high school, middle school, right across the river to go into Central River Park. And that would be part of the overall plan that would be taken care of by this. So it would be a walk across the way and they'd be going to the park, which would be a really nice feature for a lot of people just to access the park. Forget the rail trail, just to access the park. So it's a very exciting project for a lot of different reasons that I think the town is really going to embrace um, uh, besides having access to 
all this new recreation that we've never had before. So I think it's exciting. We'll go anywhere. We'll go anywhere we can to get this done because it's it's it just it, it's not going to be very expensive for us. And also, um, we've solved all the technical problems. Um, it, it, the funding, you know, while the funding is here, MassDOT, he's already applied to MassDOT with the project. He's already applied for the grant. He's already done the grant. So we're waiting to hear for that. Um, but the exciting part is, um, is that there's, there appears to be what MassDOT is telling us is there money to give us the nine, ten million dollars to get it done. It's that good of a project. So we have a strong possibility of getting that money um, sooner than later. That's great news. Yeah, it's really good news. So I, I just mentioned it creates business too. And if you go down to the cave and you go on the trail there, you'll see the little ice cream shop. Okay? Yeah, no, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge in so many different ways. It'd be a great thing for us. And it would connect right up to River Park. So it'd be, that would be your main access point um, for the town to get inside there. On that funding piece, I just want to ask you if you know of the details. Is it a matching, we would provide matching funding for it? Yeah, I mean, just technically, I think it's about, for the phase one, it's $650,000. He's already applied for a grant to bring that down by about 300000 but it'd be 650 to get phase one done, then MassDOT comes in, gives you approval, then you can deal with the sensitive topics, and then phase two of the 75% plan would be another $625,000, $650,000, again, potential for grant. And then once you have that all done, then the state comes in and gives you the money. Okay. And the other aspect of this, I remember the last time he was before us was, um, making it a venture with the uh, connecting communities. In other words, them it, all, all of us being a part of the same it, it, it has to be. You, yeah, I mean, dot, they get more interested when you connect with other communities. They want yeah. to do that. And we weren't so much with one side but the other, but we are now with all sides of this. Well, um, so right now, um, we would stop at the end of Ipswich River, Chestnut, right there. Um, but Am I saying that right? Just, what's the cross street there? Yes. Yeah. Right there. That would be where we'd stop. We wouldn't go all the way downtown at this point because that involves bridges that are very expensive, potentially. Oh. But it would go all the way out to Linfield, which is where um, you would connect up with Willis Woods. And that gets you to every place you want to go to on the North Shore. Oh. Yeah, so it's a huge, huge deal. And, and the slides he's prepared is to show you the big picture and then to bring it down to what we're, we're going to actually do ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions on that? Or oh, it would also oh, give you fantastic. access. It would also give you access to the Smith property we've never had before. Not, not driving in, but you'd be able to access mm -hmm. for the bridge to get in there as well. Okay. All right. Um, Huge deal. So we look forward to bringing it forward to you. And if we can't do it soon enough, we're happy to go to other stuff. But we wanted to start here first. You want the fi funding piece first before you present to the public. Do you want to lock that we could in? do it sooner. It's the um, sensitivity of some properties being affected. That's yes, the part I want to yes. discuss with all of you first before we get to that. Right. Well, we, we discussed publicly that portions of this would need to go through private land. I think we've talked about that publicly before. That, that's a, then yeah. if you want to do it public, we could do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, let's put it this way. The property owners who would be affected, and there's only three, um, know about it. So that it's not like they're, they would be surprised. Okay. Yeah. All right. They would not be surprised. Okay. Um, and, okay. Is so it sounds any good. Any other, any other, um. No, it's the biggest thing on my mind. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Um, no board member reports, but new business I want to go back to the beginning of the night at public comment with Mr. Evans, um, and what he was discussing, and I'm just so curious about I would like to hear more. Um, I didn't feel like it was the time for me to start asking questions and getting into that. So, um, you know, just his points of inconsistencies and health decisions and mandate decisions. I mean, on the record, everybody knows I'm not a fan of mandates. Um, never support, I, I would not support any ever. So. Um, I just thought what he had to say was so interesting, and I didn't know if maybe we could bring him back and on an agenda item, or I'd like to hear more of what he was proposing. I was curious. 
maybe you should get his number and call and ask him. But he was presenting it to the board. Right, he, and he made a position statement about wanting to know more about policies and wanting to get more involved but in if policies. But if he could get a committee together is what he was asking. A committee, Some on, kind of committee on policies? Yeah, I, I, there's, there's no questions I have for him more and sat there and thought about it. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you can flesh that out. Okay. Directly. Bring it. Bring it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <coughs> We're going to have a. We are meeting as a. We are in the many, 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 many meetings that we amongst the many, 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 many volunteers in this town that sit on committees and boards and commissions that create policy that spend oodles and oodles and oodles and oodles and hours and hours and hours of their time. Not the least of which is Mr. Mills on our finance committee that's sitting here listening to us the whole night, who spent years and years of volunteer time on the finance committee. It, this, these aren't new topics that we come up with on a whim. Well, There's this, a lot of this volunteerism. Was new, this was new. I don't think so. Pandemic. There's a lot of volunteerism in house. this town. Definitely not. Yeah. A pandemic yeah. is something that certainly is yeah. new territory, but we have boards and commissions and officials and safety people in place to help shepherd us through that. So there is no textbook to it. There is no specific policy on it. But we have people with the knowledge and uh, you know expertise in these areas to shepherd us through that process. I think that there's a lot of misinformation. There's a ton of misinformation that's been put out there yeah. about things. You know, the mask mandate, for example, mm -hmm. what we were doing and votes we needed to take to repeal the mask mandate. If you're attending the meetings or paying attention to what the boards and commissions that are part of policy making in this town are doing, then you're going to know the truth from the fiction. But it I, isn't no. I mean, if you're going to force that issue, I was on a board and council meeting. I listened to it afterwards, and there was misinformation coming from there that I heard. So that I feel you to be around. Okay. Oh, I thought we were finished with I, I know, I just want to comment, you know, in relation to, again, Mr. Evans is listening in, but, you know, he brought it up at the Board of Health meeting, and what it was was, you know, there appeared to be some inconsistencies between the school department, Board of Health directives, or lack of directives, town hall, for example, other town buildings is in relation to the, the mask mandate and what was required, some inconsistencies. But what was pointed out that evening was, and it, it was directed towards the Board of Health. The Board of Health has the authority to dictate locally what can be done. What the Board of Health chose to do was to take some action by not taking action. They endorsed the school committee's uh, proposal to go by the DESE guidelines. They endorsed the town administrator's proposal as to how to handle town-owned buildings and, 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 and town meeting gatherings. So therefore, they didn't require to take any action specific to those venues. So DESE was different than town buildings, which was different than other places. But the Board of Health was comfortable in that what was being done, they were satisfied with. The Board of Health did take specific action in relation to the nursing home, which was more restrictive than the state guidelines and CDC guidelines because of what was happening up there. So they were ready, willing, and able to take action, took action when they thought it was necessary, endorsed by not necessarily taking any action, whatever was being implemented at the local level. So yes, there appears to be inconsistencies within the buildings as to who had to wear what, when, and where. However, there wasn't a lack of understanding or a lack of policy understanding. You have to keep in mind that the town administration, Board of Health, school committee were meeting on weekly, two and three times a week over the last two years. Everybody was well aware as to what was being done and was very transparent as to how everything was being implemented. So uh, while there may be on the surface an implementation differential in different places, that may be so. But to your point, Madam Chair, you know, the administration, the people that we have working for us in the town and the people who are responsible for public health have done a very responsible job in handling the situation.
people can disagree in relation to should we have won these, should have been required, and again, I have very strong feelings which are very different than Mrs. Gonzalez. Right. You know, and I've expressed my consternation with the town administration, and again, I'm not, I was never fully satisfied, no, was she. So, was there a middle ground struck? I would say yes, there was, you know, but some people are less satisfied than others. So again, I, I don't know that we need to have a study committee to study how the policies and I, I think we do a pretty good job here. There's a lot of internal communication amongst departments, among different agencies, between the schools, between general government, public safety, public health, and I think we're in pretty good shape. But I, I appreciate him bringing up the concern. I thought it was addressed appropriately. Apparently, he was not satisfied. And I understand that and accept the fact that he may not be satisfied. And I also I want to add to that that you know the Board of Health is is a regulatory authority. They derive their role and responsibility and actions based on regulations that have been in place for decades and and also included coronavirus in the regulations. So an outbreak of an infectious disease or an infectious virus, that, that is their textbook. That is their lane. And that isn't creating a new policy because DESE puts in a, a mask guideline that they would like to endorse. That's not creating a policy. I agree with Mr. O'Leary. There's a difference between, you know, challenging that people aren't doing anything or doing the wrong thing or doing things based on misinformation because you disagree with what a board of commission or the select board decided and and saying you know there's no policies there's a lack of understanding of policies or you know it was the wrong policy there's a big difference between saying they're inconsistent policies which is not accurate and i disagree with the action that you those are two totally separate things. And they are the regulatory authority that we look to to make those types of decisions. And the town administrator relies upon them in terms of what he effectuates for the rest of the people here. And the overarching concern of everybody involved in what they did or didn't do or how restrictive or how non-restrictive they were was the safety of the public. That's the bottom line. They're not bad people or evil people because no, they're, they're who, trying to protect anybody them. Is saying that. I, I hear the rhetoric, and they're not bad folks That's not trying what I was to saying. do. Can trying I move, to can I move the question? Move the question. That's not what I was saying yeah. from them. But I will look further, and I will have a conversation with them. You should, because I, again, there's a lot of lanes and a lot of people That's are volunteering not what I was on what different I was boards, saying. commissions, and committees here that are, we just sat for a trash, on a trash committee on making a policy change, and they've been working on that for years. It's not new, and there's a lot of committees that are doing things, volunteering their time, and working on behalf of the betterment of the community for years and years on committees to help the town out. And, and I think that they should be applauded for their volunteerism. I don't necessarily agree with Mr. Greenberg, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna, he, he is investing hours and hours of his time for the same amount of money that we all get paid to, to help the town out. He's not doing anything for a personal reason, he's doing something to help our town out. And those people should be applauded for that effort. And if people wanna come in and be part of that policy making, do it. We are begging people to volunteer for committees. We're begging people to show up at our town meetings. Do it. Come and join us. Run for office. Run for office. Take the job. The pay is low, but the rewards are high. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say sometimes we should do it. And, <laughs> by the way, I love my colleague here. She's a wonderful person. <laughs> and we, we debate about a lot of things. Yes, but we do. We lovingly. We lovingly debate. I, I agree with her, but I disagree. I tell her I agree with what you're saying, but I totally disagree all the time. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> okay, all right. So can we, is there anything else you want to add to that? We're ready to go. We're ready to go. We're ready to move on. We're ready to move forward, and we're ready to move forward together. 
<laughs> towards the same goals for the betterment of our community. And to that note, I think this whole board is very respectful of each other, even if we agree with disagree. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You agree. <laughs> <laughs> Do you disagree with your oh, <laughs> We need a motion. I have a motion. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. I second that. I can agree to that. All those in favor. Aye. 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 A